start off with our opening statement here. So for the record, my name is Julia Mejia, City Councilor at Large. I am the chair of the Boston City Council's Committee on Labor, Workforce Development, um, and Economic uh, Development. In accordance with Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, modifying certain requirements of the open meeting law and relieving public bodies of certain requirements, including the requirement that public bodies conduct its meetings in a public place, that is open and physically accessible to the community, the City Council will be conducting this hearing virtually via Zoom and it is being recorded. This enables the City Council to carry out its responsibilities while ensuring public access to its deliberations through adequate alternative means. The public may also watch this hearing via live stream at www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV and on Xfinity 8 and RCN 82 files 964. It will also be re-broadcasted um, at a later date. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccc.labor at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all counselors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. If you wish to sign up for public testimony and have not done so yet, Please email Ron Cobb at ron.cobb at boston.gov <clears throat> for the link and your name will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on docket 0153, an order for a hearing regarding bi the biannual review of the Boston Employment Commission and Boston Residents' Jobs Policy. This matter was sponsored by Councilor Louis Jean, Councilor Morrell, and Councilor Fernandez Anderson, and referred to my committee on January 11th, 2023. I am joined here by my colleagues in the order of arrival. We have President Councilor Flynn um, from District 2, Councilor Liz Braden representing District 9, uh, the lead sponsor, Councilor Louis Jean at large, Councilor uh, Morrell representing District 4. And I believe we may also have Councillor Aaron uh, Murphy at large. Not sure, but you're on here. I'm here, yep. You are, okay, great. It's just a little bit of a typo here. Here we go. All right, at large. And uh, we will call and acknowledge my other colleagues if and they uh, do arrive. So for the administration panel, we are joined by Jody Sugarman um, Brosman, I believe is the Deputy Chief of Worker Empowerment. Um, uh, we believe that she will be joining us. Um, we have Chris Brown, who is the manager of the Boston Jobs um, Policy. Matthew Rensing Resinger, who is the Senior Economic uh, economic uh, Economist, excuse me, for the Boston Planning Development Agency. And for our community panel, we are joined by the BEC Commissioner, uh, Joe um, Cole, J.C. Burton, the Chair and Commissioner. Um, okay. And we are going to, um, I am going to just, we do, we will be taking public testimony, but just to give you guys an overview, we're going to um, start off with opening remarks from our lead um, sponsors and uh, then go over to my colleagues and I will keep my remarks short. So with that all said, I am going to turn it over to Councillor Louis Jen. You now have the floor. Thank you, Councillor Mejia, and good morning, everyone. Um, I thank uh, the members of the administration um, and members of the community for being here to discuss the Boston residents' job policy. Um, it is uh, critically important that we continue to try to get this right. Um, I'm encouraged by the work of the Office of Worker Empowerment now having jurisdiction over the Boston residents' job policy, really thinking critically. I'm excited to dive into the economic impact analysis that your office, that the Office of Worker Empowerment did to really help us understand where are the gaps, where exactly we're falling short in the Boston residents' job policy that requires uh, Boston residents, uh, percentages for Boston residents, um, a, a woman and people of color, uh, targets and goals for us to meet when we're talking about um, our development that's happening here, both on public and private uh, projects. Um, it's critically important that we know that 
jobs in construction and jobs in development are really pathways to the middle class for, uh, for folks. And we want to make sure that uh, uh, groups that have been traditionally excluded from these fields, we're talking about women, we're talking about people of color, are able to gain a foothold. And so I know we've heard uh, during what we've had these hearings, we've heard from Building Pathways and the incredible work that they're doing. We've heard from some union leaders in the works, work that they do. It um, Shout out to the both the plumbers and the sheet metal workers and Mia and Manny and the work that they're doing to really make sure that the trades are, are open and inclusive, especially to our BPS students and our Boston residents. We still have a long way to go, but I do feel like there's at least progress being made in, in identifying the problems and in thinking about solutions. So I look forward to the discussion today with my colleagues, members of administration, and I thank everyone for being here. Thank you, Councillor Louis Jen. I'm now going over to Councillor Burrell um, from District 4. You have the floor, and I just want to note um, that, Chris, you have your hands up, and I'm not sure if that if you have anything that you need to say now, and if so, right. you have Right, point. I do. Um, we, uh, the Deputy Chief um, Jody Sugarman Brosen, she's in the meeting, but I think she needs to be promoted as a panelist. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm sure someone from central staff will make sure that she is able to do that. Thank you, Chris. Now I'm going to kick it over to Councilor Rural from District 4. You now have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for um, everyone that's here in attendance. This is a uh, very important matter and one of um, the priorities in my office um, as we develop and continue to develop, develop here in the city of Boston, we have to ensure um, that communities that have been left out are part of the economic boom or economic growth um, that takes place in our city and the uh, Boston residence, residence job policy um, is one tool that we have. Um, our office has, you know, worked with developers on hosting um, job fairs at, at the site to bring more people um, from the communities onto the construction sites. Uh, we've met with um, building pathways and the trades uh, to see what more can be done. And we're looking to continue to work with all the stakeholders uh, to see how we could take a more proactive approach um, keep an eye on those numbers on a monthly basis or weekly basis um, to continue to push our developers on um, ensuring that, you know, the workforce um, is equitable and diverse um, and is contributing across all fields. Thank you, Chair. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Councillor Rorel. I am now going to turn it over to Councillor Anderson. You now have the floor. And three, two, one, Councilor Anderson, I'll come back to you. Um, I am now going to move over uh, in order of arrival. Um, we're going to start off with Councilor uh, President Flynn. You now have the floor, followed that then by Councilor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the sponsors and to the chair, to the administration officials that are here, but also to the public. This is one of the most important hearings of the year, and I especially love hearing from, from the public. I know we're, we're virtual, but um, your testimony is critical. It's important. I always like getting to these meetings early, so I'm able to talk to the public in person, but obviously we can't, we can't do that today. Um, this is an important ordinance designed to give greater employment opportunities to our residents of color and women in construction trades. I'd also like to acknowledge the Boston Building Trades, Brian Doherty, uh, for the incredible work that he's been doing in the building trades. Um, it's, it's important that we continue working together. Um, in 1986, Mayor Flynn and the City Council amended the ordinance, establishing the Boston Employment Commission to enforce this policy. We have the policy on place, in place, but are we going to enforce it? That's the key, that's the key question. Um, and what has the city, city of Boston, what has the city council done over the last year in ensuring that policy has been in, implemented in, and enforced? That's what I'm looking to hear from today. What have we done specifically to, um, to, improve, to improve this matter? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, President Flynn. I'm now going to uh, kick it over to Councillor Breeden. You now have the floor. 
Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to everyone who's here this morning. Um, I'm really excited. I, I try not to miss this hearing every year when we do this review of progress on the Boston uh, resident jobs policy. Um, I think it's a crucial and really important uh, tool in the toolbox to ensure that uh, the, all the that we have good paying union jobs in construction and that our women and communities of color have access to those jobs. Um, in Austin Brighton, we're seeing a huge amount of uh, new construction labs and residential buildings, etc. And every project that we review, uh, we recommend that uh, the developer uh, abide by the Boston residence job policy. Uh, and the big question is, uh, do we have a pipeline with enough of those jobs and those people that are ready and able to take those opportunities? We're asking them to take these, and then they have this sort of lame excuse, oh, we can't, we can't find people who are residents. And, and, uh, and, and then we see the neighborhood filled with uh, trucks from New Hampshire and God knows where. So um, I really, this is an important issue for me personally in the neighborhood uh, and across the, and the city. Uh, I think we're seeing a huge economic boom, a lot of development, and our, neighbor, our neighbors, who, uh, women and communities of color should be able to get access to these jobs and build a good, strong middle class life and be able to afford to live in Boston. So I look forward to the conversation. I hope we're going to chart some progress. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to all for being here. Thank you, Councillor Breeden. Really super excited to have you here with us. I am now going to uh, move on to Councillor at Large Murphy. You now have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking forward to this conversation. I mean, my colleagues said a lot of what um, I hope we get to today. I wish we didn't have to have these meetings every year. I wish that we were, um, you know, kids coming out of high school and young adults already felt that there were jobs out there for them and that, um, you know, that the opportunities were there. So looking forward to the conversation. And also it's important that city jobs should be going to city kids, but we have lots of hearings over the last couple of years. And when we pass contracts, we talk about many of our city employees who have a residency expectation are some of our lowest paid employees in the city. So making sure that we're um, paying our workers fairly and also these great jobs that we see, Councilor Braden mentioned it, I see it all across the city at job sites with New Hampshire pickup plates. Um, license plates on pickup trucks. So how do we make sure that kids see themselves, young adults, adults see themselves in these jobs? I think that's also part of the work that we have to do here on the council. So thank you for this hearing and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, so I don't think I have any other colleagues here. So I'm just gonna uh, open up with a uh, brief remarks. I, I feel like I'm so incredibly blessed. I My daughter's home sick today, so um, this was, at a virtual hearing, but thank goodness it was because it allowed me to go pick her up and bring her home. So I am happy that this turned out the way that it did. And I know how important it is for us to also be in community and Councilor Flynn, I really do appreciate you um, uplifting the, the importance of that human connection. So I just wanna say it's a bittersweet moment for me because I get to be home and get my daughter here and also show up for work. So it's a blessing in disguise and it's all how we choose to experience it. And so I'm really, grateful that I had the flexibility to do that today. So I just wanna thank the administration and BEC um, commissioner for being here today. I'm also looking forward to going over updates from our last hearing and learning more about the work that the um, Boston, um, the BRJP has been doing to ensure the city of Boston is increasing its contracting opportunities for black and brown com and communities of color, women and Boston residents. The last time we were here, and I think the many times we've Previously, I think I've been talking about this in 2020. I've been requesting a, a dashboard, um, and I also have been asking specific questions around communication and how do how are we measuring and benchmarking success? Right, like I really want to lean in to a little bit more in that area. I'm really curious about the type of feedback, if any, that is provided to folks who um, have not managed to successfully uh, gain opportunities. So I, I'd love to dig in a little bit deeper there. 
And I'm just curious to learn what else we could be doing on the council to help support your efforts. So I am going to hold some of those questions um, for the question portion, but for now, really super excited to have you all here um, so that we can do this work collaboratively. So with that being said, we will have the administration and BEC commissioners um, present together. So you each, five, you each have five minutes to present. So Jody, I believe you are here with us. I am, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, counselors, for having us here today. Um, I am, have the honor of being Deputy Chief in the Worker Empowerment Cabinet. Our Chief of Worker Empowerment, Trin Nguyen, sends her regards. Unfortunately, Trin was, um, Chief Nguyen was traveling today, uh, but I will be bringing all the questions, comments, and follow-up back to Chief Nguyen after this hearing. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, go. And can folks see that okay? Yes, we can. I, at least I can. Not sure if my colleagues, if my Great. colleagues. Can yeah, we can see it. Great. So um, I'm going to hop right in to the agenda. Um, first of all, it will be myself, our BRJP manager, Christopher Brown, and senior economist from the Boston Planning Development Agency presenting today. And for today, we have plans just to go briefly through some of the, um, trans the transition process to the new work empowerment cabinet, a little bit of history. Um, we have, we're very lucky to have senior economist uh, Matthew Ressiger with us today who has completed an economic impact analysis on the economic impact of our um, failing to meet some of the hiring goals of the Boston Resident Jobs Policy. And then of course, we'll bring the data, uh, our Chris Brown, our BRJP manager, will talk about that. And is Councillor President Flynn talked about that pipeline? We have some work to some presentation and information about our work around the pipeline. And as you know, because we're now part of the Work of Empowerment Cabinet, I'll be saying a little bit more about what our Office of Workforce Development in particular is doing before we move on to some Boston Employment Commission updates. And I see Chair Burton with us today. So thank you so much for joining us, Chair Burton. Um, just quickly, the Boston Resident Jobs Policy moved from the, uh, the Cabinet for Econ from the Office of Supplier Diversity into the Office of Labor Compliance and Worker Protection. We're part of the Worker Empowerment Cabinet. Um, as part of that, in addition to the Boston Resident Jobs Policy, our office also enforces the living wage, Boston Jobs Living Wage and Prevailing Wage Ordinance. Um, it also enforces our Boston Wage Theft Executive Order, our new Construction Safety Ordinance, which I'll say a little bit more out at the end. And we are doing a lot of work now to um, on training and outreach to ensure workers know their rights and how to exercise those rights. Um, and uh, the history, I think, most folks know this, but the original ordinance was passed in 1983. Uh, it was meant for all public projects and projects over 100,000 square feet. And the goal was or, to hire 50% or more total work hours to, for Boston residents, 25% total work hours to people of color, and 10% for women. Um, we then, it was then updated in 2017, and the numbers that we are striving for now are 51% Boston residents, 40% people of color, and 12% women. And the way that we look at compliance, because we cannot um, sanction our, the contractors for not meeting those hiring guidelines, the compliance with this ordinance is based on these seven compliance measures attending pre-construction meetings, providing weekly certified payrolls, which is what we use to measure their compliance with the hiring goals, attending corrective action meetings when required, appearing at BEC meetings, providing communications confirmations, and providing referrals to the job bank, and verifying that the residents that they've hired are in fact Boston residents. That's just the background. Before we give you the updated numbers for the last six months, I'm going to um, hand it over to Matthew Resiger, who is going to present um, some uh, an analysis that was requested by the Boston 
Employment Commission of the economic impact of meeting the Boston Resident Jobs Policy requirements. Matthew, you can just tell me next slide when you're ready. Great. Um, can can yeah. everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah. As as uh, you know, thank you all for for uh, having me today. Um, and so, as was alluded to, you know, this work grew out of a question asked, you know, by the Boston Employment Commission about the broader economic impact of of sort of meeting. Um, you know, particularly the, the resident goal in, in the Boston residents' jobs policy. And so, so I'll talk a, a little bit more about that, uh, you know, why that's specifically the, the piece we're looking at in a second. But just in terms of, you know, the economic impact, uh, um, you know, often, um, you know, so we're sort of asked about economic impact of, of a specific investment in, in the city or bringing a, a, you know, a company to the city. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think the goal here is, is to emphasize that, that in addition to the very important direct impact uh, that, that so many have already spoken to about the importance of the Boston residents' jobs policy and the importance of meeting these criteria for the lives of Boston residents, that there's also an indirect impact, that there's additional economic benefits that accrue by keeping uh, that the money uh, earned on, on construction projects in the city of Boston local uh, to, to local residents. And so, so that locality is really what we're going to focus on here. Um, the indirect impact, the additional impact that having wages accrue to residents would have on economic activity within the city's border. So next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so um, I think you know, Jody already sort of showed the, the background uh, of, of the BRJP uh, and um, you know, the, the current requirements that, that uh, you know, reflect the, the 2017 ordinance that 51% of total work hours of journey people and 51% of total work hours of apprentices in each trade must go to Boston residents, that 40% uh, of, of total work hours and uh, journey people and apprentices uh, go to people of color and 12% and, and of those work hours uh, be worked by, by women. So because our study is, is this geographic focus, we're gonna, we're gonna focus on that 51% requirement about Boston residency, about the importance of keeping uh, the, the earnings uh, earned on construction projects local. That isn't that, that that's in any way more important than the other two requirements, but, but this type of spatial analysis um, that, that we're gonna be doing is, is sort of, um, you know, relies on, on, on data um, about, about how uh, money flows between geographic localities. And, and so that's where we're, our focus for this analysis is going to be. Next slide. Um, so, you know, developers and contractors, uh, I, I mean, continue to fall short of the BR, BRJP required thresholds. I think that, that has been reflected by, by um, you know, the comments uh, that, that all of the counselors made in, in the introduction. Um, so we're looking here at calendar year 2022, um, and in, in the, the data that we were pulling, um, you know, in this summer and fall, so once all those hours for 2022 were, were accounted for, only 23% of tracked hours uh, were worked by Boston residents in the calendar year of 2022. Um, and as you know, we saw in the prior slide, you know, the, the requirement is sort of trade by trade. Um, that, that we're meeting the 51% requirement. And so no trade with more than 1,000 hours worked uh, met the 51% Boston residence requirement. So, so next slide. So we can see here the trades sort of reported uh, in the BRJP uh, compliance data. Um, you know, both the, the projects tracked uh, by the, the BPDA, um, through the BPDA system as, as well as, as um, through uh, the uh, economic development, uh, uh, opportunity and inclusion cabinet. Um, th you know, all of these hours, um, you know, are falling well short of the 51%. So we can see that that some of the biggest, um, you know, categories tracked in the data: laborers, carpenters, electricians, iron workers, plumbers, pipe fitters. Um, you know, in the kind of mid 20s, um, and that's pretty typical th throughout the trades that we see in this table. Um, and so, so we're also there mm -hmm. listing, um, you know, we pulled a prevailing wage sheet to, to, to look at the, the types of wages um, that, that would be, um, you know, paid um, in, in, on these projects. And, and, you know, one of the, the reasons that, that this policy is so important are, is that these, these hourly wages are, you know, as, as has been alluded to, you know, strong 
um, well-paying jobs um, that, that we're hoping to, to get, um, get more Boston residents in to, to raise those numbers um, from the, the you know, 10s and 20 percent that we see here. So the next slide up to sort of meeting the requirements. So what are we simulating here? We're looking at what, what would be the impact um, for uh, the city as a whole um, if we, if we you know, raised those totals from the sort of mid 10s and 20s that they were before to, to 51% in each and every trade um, in, uh, you know, in, uh, under the policy. So next slide. Um, so, so first, you know, that's sort of what we're thinking of as the direct impact. So what is the direct impact? I mean, I think it's worth emphasizing here that the direct impact, I mean, is the most important thing, that, that the most important, you know, piece of the policy, as has been alluded to, is, is connecting Boston residents to these, uh, you know, well-paying jobs, and that there's 2.6 million construction hours. Again, this is the calendar year of 2022. That may be different than, than the, the timeline that's presented later. Um, but that was 2.6 million construction hours in, in the calendar year of 2022 uh, that uh, you know, would, would need to, to have moved from, as people alluded to, um, you know, folks from New Hampshire or, or, or anywhere outside of the city of Boston um, to residents in the city of Boston. Um, when using the prevailing wage rates, which would, you know, would be applicable on most projects, though not not every project, um, you know, is paying prevailing wages, but uh, but that's you know the wage rate we're using for this analysis. That's 138.5 million dollars in wages um, on construction projects that the requirement says should be going to Boston residents um, that uh, are are. Um, you know, going elsewhere. So that's the sort of shortfall, the direct shortfall. So next slide. Um, so in, in terms of calculating the indirect impact, again, we're doing this to sort of emphasize the overall economic importance of this, that it goes beyond even just those very large numbers we saw on the last slide. Um, so for that, we turn to, to the REMI model, Regional Economic Modeling Incorporated, as I said, as a sort of economic development analyst, this is a, a sort of core tool that, that um, is used to sort of identify the broader economic impact of, of economic development projects. And so even though we don't really think of BRJP itself, you know, not always thought of as an economic development project, but this is really emphasizing that, that um, you know, it, it does, like, like many things, um, sort of, you know, getting closer to those goals, um, meeting those goals would have this broader economic impact on the city. So this type of model is well suited to answer this question. I was excited uh, when Jody brought this question to us because this is a perfect kind of uh, pairing of, of question with the type of model that we have. So how reallocating wages from one geography either outside of the state or outside of, of, of the city's borders sort of within the broader metro area into, into workers who, who live within our city's borders. Um, how, how do the spending patterns of, of those uh, I individuals uh, differ? Um, Remy has sort of rich data on sort of spe spending in across a broad gamut of, of consumption categories um, within different ge geographic regions. So if you think of, you know, sort of uh, the economic impact of, say, going and spending at Home Depot, I mean, they're, they're, they're separating out, you know, the amount of that that's, um, you know, spent on, on sort of, you know, local, the local retail component of that, what's going to pay the wages of, of people at Home Depot, um, but also that, that, you know, whatever you're buying there is, is likely imported from, from uh, you know, outside and not likely to be produced within the city of Boston. And, and so, so, you know, Remy is, is allocating regionally the sort of value add that, that's at, at different places and where those wages are likely to stay. And so, um, you know, when we think about spending in the local area on things like restaurants, um, you know, things like personal care services, things that are, have this large labor component where that person that your business where you're spending is a Boston resident, where the people who that business employs are Boston residents, you know, keeping that money local rather than having that money spent in New Hampshire or in other parts of the, the metro area um, is, is going to have an additional economic impact for our city. So uh, next slide. Um, and so when thinking about measuring the, this economic impact, we want to think about where, where are the, the, these extra hours going to come from. Um, and, and so, you know, that, I mean, first of all, to, you know, emphasize, I, I mean, that is a, a, you know, 
significant um, challenge um, that, that I think you know many others on this call are, are many other, others in this meeting um, are, are going to attest to, to the ways in which um, we actually sort of make that happen in the model um, you know it it doesn't require that work to try and to try and figure out um, exactly how to get residents into the jobs it requires understanding where those where those residents are likely to come from. Are they people who are already employed in other sectors um, in the local economy? Are these people coming from unemployment? Um, are the, you know, and, and so you know, we lay out a variety of scenarios in the analysis. You know, one, looking at all of those residents coming from under un, unemployed or underemployed residents. Um, this would be more likely to be the case in a very, um, uh, you know, in an economy in which our sort of local construction sector was in recession, which is not, you know, what we see. Um, I think, you know, when we look at the data, um, you know, most Boston residents um, that, that we can see in something like the American Community Survey that are reporting um, being in the construction sector are working, um, you know, not necessarily at sort of full hours, full year, but, but are working substantially. Um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, the lower bound that we look at is, you know, sort of pulling people out of other work um, into construction. And so, and then we, we sort of use the ACS to, to, to make some reasonable estimates about where we might pull people. So that's going to be a combination of people currently in construction working more hours, people being pulled from sectors other than construction, but where they are making wages, and then some people being pulled from, from, uh, from sort of out of employment. And, and so some of these hours being, um, you know, where, where you're going from, from zero earnings to, to the reasonably high earnings that we're looking at here. And so just uh, next slide. Um, and, and so we can look at those, the, you know, those scenarios and we get, again, you know, very large numbers here. So when we're looking at the gross city product, a way that we think of as measuring sort of the entire amount of economic activity in the city, um, you know, directing. Sorry, you know, is it okay if I interject for a second? Sure. Um, Madam Chair, I don't know who to direct this to, but on the screen is your face rather than that I see is your face instead of the presentation. Is that true for everyone? I see. I, no, see, the I see the presentation. Oh, okay. Then maybe it's something wrong. All right. Apologies. Ignore me. I'll figure it out. Okay. Could could I could I make a recommendation to if could we could we all try to be on camera? I I I think it shows a little bit more respect for the um, the speaker. And and just because I'm the chair, there's my my daughter may need to walk past the screen, so I'll be going off camera if and when she needs to do that. Just for, for the record. Um, so when when we look at, at the, the sort of scenarios, you know, we get impacts on gross city product, again, the, the sort of entire economic activity in the city um, between 73.8 million and 102.9 million. Um, and and those numbers, I, I mean, to be clear, are, are quite large because this all of the construction is happening in the city anyway. It's being counted as part of our gross city product. This is in addition um, you know, this is additional economic activity beyond the construction that's already happening. Um, so, th so that's uh, things that are happening. Um, that's additional, again, restaurant spending. Um, in, in some cases, perhaps, uh, you know, additional, um, some moderate amount of additional construction by, by the fact that the city's economy um, is sort of, you know, being made somewhat larger. But, um, you know, these are jobs, um, when we look at the indirect and induced jobs, adding between 555 and 774 uh, additional jobs, again, that's beyond what we're already counting in the construction sector. Those are jobs that are going to folks uh, that, that reflect more, uh, more money being retained uh, within the city of Boston. New resident income, um, Boston residents um, increasing their income. This does include um, the, the additional income going uh, to the, the new, the, the construction workers who are now residents, whereas they, they were not residents before. But again, between 155 and $216 million uh, accruing uh, to Boston resident incomes that, that would not have otherwise uh, been, been going to Boston residents. And so, uh, next slide. Um, and yeah, so so this is just sort of re-emphasizing th those findings from from, uh, from scenario three there. So I think I'll skip to the last slide. Um, 
just just sort of concluding. And again, so because the Boston, building trades in Boston are, are highly paid and, and large gaps exist, sorry, uh, between uh, the observed hours uh, and BRJP targets, I mean, the economic impacts of, of meeting the requirement are large. And, and so, I mean, I think everyone at the beginning of the meeting emphasized, you know, the important, the central importance of this policy to, to what we're, you know, doing here um, as, as folks uh, working for the city and, and, and folks, um, you know, uh, making decisions for the city. I, I mean, I think we already knew this was important, but, but the economic impact analysis emphasizes a, a, a even you know, another dimension of importance um, in terms of the overall economic impact of the city. The direct impact of these gaining opportunity work in construction is the largest impact and the most important impact, the impact folks here have been speaking to, but that indirect impact um, you know, an additional 600 jobs on top of, of what we're talking about in, in terms of getting folks into construction, an additional $60 million in wages accruing to Boston residents. These are big numbers, and I think really emphasize the importance of the work uh, that, that so many here are, are, are doing and, and will continue to do. So, um, so thank, thank you, um, Madam Chair, and, and, and uh, to the rest of the council, and, and uh, thank you for having me. Chris? Madam Chair, would you like us to move on, or um, yes. are there questions for um, Matthew before we move on to the rest of the presentation? Let's move on to the rest of the presentation, and then we could do one round of questions for all of your um, panelists. So I'm going to pass it on to BRJP Manager Chris Brown to go through the recent data for the Boston Resident Jobs Policy Compliance. Uh, good morning. Council, uh, thanks, Jody. It's a, a hard act to follow with, with Matthew, but I, I give it a shot. Uh, so we're looking at the, uh, the breakdown from the last six months, the data. So we had 90 total active projects, um, and this data is from April 1st of 23 to September 30th of, of 23. Uh, total of 90 active projects. 23 of those projects are what we call DIPs, developmental impacted projects. Those are private projects, projects that are over 100,000 square feet. Those are the downtown projects and a lot of projects that they're in the seaport area. Uh, we have 67 city of Boston projects. So the city of Boston projects are in some way uh, either entirely or, or portion, you know, a portion of the project was funded via city funds. So 67 city, city of Boston projects, 17 from the public facilities department, 16 from the parks and recreation department, 15 from public works, and 19 from the mayor's office of housing. So uh, the private project breakdown, uh, we, you know, it's ever since this program was established, we've always had uh, more hours from the private projects just because of the size of the projects, right? The, the skyscrapers, so to speak. So we had 1,538,000 um, hours from the private projects, and there's 22% Boston resident, 36% people of color, and 8% women. The public projects, again, those are the projects that are funded in some way from city funds. So 6,011 hours and 23% Boston resident, 42% people of color and 6% women. So when you add them together, the private and the public projects, adds up to be 2,149,000 hours and a combined percentage of 22% Boston resident, 38% people of color and 7% women. Next slide, please. And so what you're looking at now, you're looking at the breakdown uh, by neighborhood. Uh, Austin Brighton is at, at the top, well, not necessarily in the order of projects, but it's in alphabetical order. So Austin Brighton, you can see they had 11 projects. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but uh, Dorchester, the biggest neighborhood, uh, 15 projects, Roxbury, 16, Rosendale, two. Uh, the last category is various locations. Sometimes you have projects, most likely they're like road public works projects. You might have uh, a contract that, you know, they're performing work on uh, some streets that are in different neighborhoods. So you might have streets in Roxbury and streets in Dorchester. So 
uh, in a situation like that, those type of projects would fall in the various locations um, category. Next slide, please. All right, so what you're looking at now is all the city departments. We have four city line departments. And so again, 67 public active projects, uh, mayor's office of housing, it had 300,000 hours. Is 23% uh, Boston resident, 49% people of color, and 5% women. Parks department, those are, you know, all the city parks, swing sets, basketball courts, uh, usually a small department, about eight projects per year, eight to 10 projects a year. Uh, 11,000 hours, 17% uh, Boston resident, 20% people of color, 3% women. Public facilities department, those are all city buildings and schools. 261,000 hours, 22% resident, 34% people of color, 7% women. Then we have public works, those are the sidewalks, the streets, so forth and so on. 22% Boston resident, 38% people of color, and 7% women. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so that would conclude that portion of my testimony. And I'll jump in to talk a little bit about our pipeline development and the Boston Resident Jobs Policy Jobs Bank. Um, the Jobs Bank has been very busy over the last year. This is a list of some of the Jobs Bank outreach efforts and job fairs that our Boston Resident Jobs Policy Coordinator has been part of and or helped organize. Um, I think we mentioned this in our last testimony, but it's um, worth Reiterating here that we now have a request for labor form, which records contractors' date specific requests and can generate a report when we get requests from contractors for um, labor from our jobs bank. We have a jobs bank roundtable, which meets monthly with community partners to um, talk about how to promote hiring, informational information, uh, inform hiring information and apprenticeship opportunities, and an extensive email database of contacts and community resources. Um, we also have a QR code and email. This is all on our website as well. And um, all of this is sent to a Google form which we can track and is date stamped. And I wanted to add that we also, now that the Boston Resident Jobs Policy Program is part of the Work Empowerment Cabinet, it's worth highlighting some of the Office of Workforce Development programs specifically designed to build the pipeline to construction. The Neighborhood Jobs Trust is um, something that many already know about, but there is a request for proposals for innovative training models that is due on November 17th. Um, the website, the link to the website is here, and I will be sharing this, this slide deck, of course. Um, but Please spread the word that we are looking for partners through the Neighborhood Job Trust. We also have a grant that we received um, um, to create the Greater Boston Equitable Apprenticeship Pathways. And the point of this grant was to connect Boston residents to pre-apprenticeship opportunities over the four-year grant period. And one of the areas in which we are focusing is in construction, and our partner in that effort is Youth Build. And finally, it's going to be National Apprenticeship Week coming up in mid-November. The Office of Workforce Development is holding a, a, an Apprenticeship Week event at the Codman Square Branch Library on Wednesday the 15th, and I'll be happy to share more information. And just yesterday, and um, we will met with staff from Youth Opportunities Unlimited, which is working on developing a construction track with support from BRJP and others as part of their their efforts to um, provide opportunities to their cohorts. And I'm going to, before I hand it um, over to Commissioner Burton, I, Chris was uh, going to give just a little bit of information about a new payroll scan, which we are providing the Boston Employment Commission each month as part of our efforts to improve compliance and um, identify non-compliance. Chris? Absolutely. Thank, thanks, Jody. So one of the uh, most important, I believe, is probably the most important um, effort. There's seven efforts, com compliance efforts, uh, but the most important one is the submission of payrolls. Everything else is 
pretty much based off the submission of, of payrolls. You know, if we don't get payrolls in a timely manner or if the payrolls are not submitted, it, it's hard to kind of quantify all the other efforts. So we, we've started um, uh, running uh, what we call a monthly payroll scan. We started it in August. So we did it for August and we did it for um, September, but just to try to get a baseline of of how payrolls are coming in and the timeliness of it. Um, so these scans will give the Boston Employment Commission a clearer picture of all payroll related non-compliance beyond those that come before the back for a special presentation or project review. So we have the Boston Employment Commission meeting every month. So on average, every year, they see maybe 40 of the projects that we have department-wide uh, when we really have in give or take every year about 200 projects year you know um, year year round um, some are small some are large uh, contractors have up to seven business days after the week ending date to submit payrolls in order for them to be considered on time and as stated previously there are seven compliance efforts the submission of the payroll is one of them and there's six other efforts that Jody previously mentioned uh, next slide please all right, so this is the monthly payroll scan for September. Uh, so of all the projects that we have, we had 3,395 total payrolls submitted for the month of September. 10% uh, of those uh, payrolls uh, ended up being considered late. That would be 324 of those payrolls. And again, they're late after seven business days. And then we have a breakdown uh, of the 10% of the late payroll, 67% of them were uh, less than five days late. 25% uh, of those payrolls were five to 10 days late. 8% of those payrolls were greater than 10 days. And the latest payroll uh, was 19 days late. Um, the payroll scan does not include contractors that may have worked on site but never reported or submitted payroll, if any. Site visits are the, more act, the most accurate way to catch contractors on the site that have not submitted weekly payrolls. So we do site, we perform site visits. On occasion, we do run into to contractors that for some reason haven't submitted. Uh, it doesn't happen often. Uh, and when we do run into those contractors, usually they're like maybe a curb cutting, you know, a contractor that's out there for the day or for the week. Uh, uh, but, okay, so uh, next slide. All right, so we did a comparison. Again, we started the scan in August, and um, so we performed for August and September. So you see the comparison. Uh, in August, there were 2,948 payrolls submitted. September, 3,395. Uh, in August, when you look at late payrolls submitted, 16% uh, of those payrolls was late, as opposed to September, 10% uh, of those payrolls uh, ended up being late. Don't know why. Maybe it's because we started this payroll scan, not sure. Uh, but, and so, and the latest payroll again for August was 27 days. That's the latest that any payroll was submitted in August and in September it ended up being 19 days. Uh, next slide, please. All right, fines for sanctionable uh, violations can be up to $300 a day and are, are assessed to the general contractor. Staff's working on a process to determine when to recommend sanctions and fines in a consistent and transparent manner that takes into factors into account factors defined by the Boston Employment Commission sanctions policy. One, size of business of the general contractor, two, numbers of staff persons employed by the business, three, any previous complaints or notices of non-compliance issued by the commission, four, additional factors may be included in final decisions made by the commission prior to the issuance of a sanction. And then we have all the additional factors being considered as well. I'm not gonna read every one of them, but they are on this, um, slide. So that would conclude this portion of my testimony. 
Thank you, Chris. And just before we wrap up, I just wanted to thank the counselors here for your support of, while not directly connected, it is connected um, for helping us pass the new Boston Construction Safety Ordinance, which goes into effect in December, and um, would love your help in spreading the word. We are doing webinars for contractors starting tonight at six o'clock. We have over 200 contractors signed up to learn more about the ordinance. So I just wanna thank you for your support and share information on that. Um, and I can stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the entire administration uh, for your thoughtful presentation. I am going to just ask a quick question before I move on. Um, what we're going to do is move into uh, questions, but um, and then move on to the community panel, JC. Unless, why don't we just have you go, JC, so that we can just have one full swoop and have everyone here, all means all in the conversation. But Jody, really quick, since you just mentioned, I'm curious if that um, announcement has gone on, gone out in multiple languages. The construction safety? Yep. Yep, multiple, all uh -huh. top 11 languages, and we have yes. brochures and multilingual, and the, we are also, uh, the webinars will be available in multiple languages as well. I just want to note for the record, y'all, that the administration is definitely uh, following suit in that language access ordinance that we passed, one of the top 11 languages, and they are handling their business. Love to see it. Thank you all for doing that. All right, then, um, JC, I'm going to go straight to you so that we can all have one conversation and make this more of a dialogue. I think what happens here in the city council is that people come in for a hearing and everyone feels like they're on trial. Look, this is not that. This is really an opportunity for us to really unpack the work. And also, where are the points of like growth? You know, we have to uplift the things that we're doing well. We have to be able to uh, zoom in on the things that we could be doing better. And the only way we're going to get better is if we get things on the record. So for those who are paying attention and tuning in, know that this is not a trial. This is definitely an opportunity for us to listen and learn, and more importantly, as colleagues, be able to work together so that our residents um, see that we are doing the people's business here. So JC, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Thank you, good morning everybody. Councilor Committee on Labor, Workforce and Economic Development, and the Chair Mayha, as well as sponsors of Gene World. So glad to be with you today, as well as other council members. It's the first time we've actually had such a large, a packed house, and so I'm excited to, to give you some thoughts of what we see uh, as working on the Boston Employment Commission. I, I want you to know that I have 28 years of construction experience. I represent this commission of five people. It's three men and two women. There are people of color, but all of us have direct or indirect construction experience. I have the great honor to serve the committee and the commission to shepherd construction jobs to the citizens of Boston, people of color and women, as well as hold those accountable that fail to meet compliance requirements. Today, I'd like to report on three themes that summarize the past six months. One says that one is data utilization, two, contractor compliance, and three, innovation, innovative trends that will certainly drive the future. First, data utilization. In the summary of what was presented today, is requested by the Boston Employment Commission. We have also requested other data touch points that we know the uh, city staff will be reporting on in the near future. But what we want to hone in today, as I know we heard earlier, but only 23% of the hours are staffed by women, the men and women residing in the city of Boston, which means 77% of those hours are being worked by people that reside outside of the city of Boston. And there are no other words to describe it other than this tremendous failure on our citizens. This is a collective effort of our contractors, by which I'm part of the community, our subcontractors, trade contractors, organized labor union partners that deliver projects to our city. In other words, only less than three out of 10 trades, men and women, three out of 10 on a project reside in the city. This data, unfortunately, is no different than a decade ago or a decade before that or a decade before that. The construction industry com uh, employs are employees the most sophisticated tools that, that we have that are being developed here right in the city of Boston. We utilize drones. We, we are testing utilization of robots in hazardous construction conditions. Yet we don't have the same energy and zeal to invite, train, sustain, and reward Boston citizens and people of color. It's really at this point, unexcusable. 
but the data will always help us drive numbers. The Boston Employment Commission has also asked for deeper dives in the data so that we have a better understanding of who is working on our project sites. We have requested there's a, a, a uh, ability for us to determine the designation of people of color specifically. So we would like to know um, if there are which, how many black people are working on a project, how many Latinx people are working on a project, how many Asian people are working on a project, just so that we have clear understanding of what that people of, what people of color actually mean. We know that the staff is working on that. We've also asked the staff to look at case studies. We want to study both things that are working well, as well as the challenges that we've had. And, and although the data presented today is, is not uh, what we would like it to be, there are definitely projects that are innovative and are certainly meeting some of our project requirements. Next, I'd like to talk about contract compliance. There are seven determinants for compliance failure. All are administrative in, in nature, as we heard earlier. For example, some failing to submit payroll data, failure to verify employee demographics, failure to miss a G BRJP meeting could result in review of, for sanctions, ultimately resulting in a fine. Early this year, during my testimony in March, we reported that they were indeed the first ever sanction in the history of the BJRP. This is not something that I'm fond of. I don't really enjoy reporting this. Um, but yet, the data that you've heard today is with the reason why we have had no choice but to, um, uh, to employ sanctions. Those companies that were sanctioned have indeed paid their fines, um, and we are thankful that they have done so. As chair, we continuously try to steer the Boston Employment Commission from aggressive shouting matches to more constructive conversation and dialogue where we can better understand the challenges at hand. The sanctioned companies have paid their fines, as I mentioned early, and have pledged to do better. In order to do so, we also need our organized labor unions um, and other workforce partners to help support the effort with actionable engagement. Lastly, I'd like to talk about some innovative trends. In the same month that the, that the BAC is reviewing a larger list of construction companies that are not in compliance, as, as Mr. Brown has identified earlier, we can also report that there is one mega project. This project is $1.5 billion in value that has a, that has a unique commitment to the city. Uh, the project is reporting, is, the project is only 10% complete and has a construction timeline of, of seven years. So the project will not finish until 2030, but even in its 10% of reporting period, it is, is almost exceeding all of our goals. The overall project is not quite meeting our 51% Boston residents goal. It's reporting almost 30% Boston residents. It's exceeding the people of color goal with 42% and exceeding 15%, exceeding female participation with 15%. I'm pausing on this moment because this is absolutely historic. When we start projects, most of the contractors and trade contractors involved are utility in nature, the construction or demolition in nature, and usually have the lowest number of participation by people of color and women in Boston residents. Typically, these numbers report, on average, uh, a fraction of what we're seeing here. This we what we know that this project is is likely to be set set, set up for success, and that early on in the project, the contractor and it's a joint venture team that is making uh, decisions to help drive um, participation by the companies. Let me give you the context of that. The joint venture general contractor is employing 52% Boston residents, 84% people of color, and 42% women. I'm going to repeat that. 52 Boston residents, 84% people of color, and I should say 52% Boston residents, 84% people of color, and 42% women. They are driving the economic engine and understanding that our needs, our goals is to employ as many Boston residents as possible and are setting the tone of the project site. We know that this is a single project snapshot of success that have resulted in the passionate pleas from commissioners, staff, all the councils that are here today, a host of concerned citizens that have been helping to provide out of the box thinking on how to engage the Boston residents and people of color and women. I also want to take a moment to make sure that we are including in this advocacy the late Nakia Baker Gomez, who we lost earlier this year, forever thankful for her consistent and tireless advocacy for the men, women, and youth entering the construction industry. And that concludes my comments for today. Thank you so much. Thank you, JC. Really do appreciate um, the energy that you bring to this conversation and how important it is for us to ground ourselves in 
the whole picture, right? Because sometimes we have a half a scene and we want to know what's on the other side. So I really do um, appreciate your perspective and insight. And again, I want to remind um, the administration that this is really an opportunity for us to um, lean in. And while I do appreciate that my colleagues have come here prepared with questions and all of that good stuff, I, I really am encouraging us to also really think about um, solutions. I, I think what I have learned in my three and a half years here is that it is we are so much more effective when we're able to bring bring real um, life experience uh, ideas and, and perspective and, and, and solutions to help support the work. So definitely looking forward to your questions and encouraging you all to utilize this moment to help um, identify what we can do. So with that said, I'm gonna open it up now for my colleagues to um, interact with our panelists. So I'm gonna go first to Councilor Louis Shen. You now have the floor. Uh, you're on mute, um, Councilor Louis Shen. Just wanted to let you know that. Sorry, rookie mistake. Um, I just wanna thank everyone again. I think um, this presentation for me um, was incredible because it was really data-driven and it was giving really concrete examples. So I want to thank uh, uh, Matt, uh, Director Brown, uh, uh, Director Sugarman uh, brosen uh, Chair Burton, I thought it was incredible. Going to start my questions with you, Matt. Um, again, I think that I'm really grateful that the Office of Worker, it was the Office of Worker Empowerment that asked for this research, is that I think that this was incredible because it is data-driven and it shows um, what some of the gaps, um, what some of the gaps are. Um, I, I, my first question is, I don't know if I caught it, but why was it, why is the data that you looked at Boston specific? Is it because that's what um, Jody you had asked for? Um, why is it not also the other metrics that are important to us? You know, people of color and gender i'm wondering why we didn't why we didn't do that or, or and if there's a vision for us to do that breakdown as well yeah i mean i think the request for the analysis i mean was really focused on that the sort of indirect impact and, and sort of um the that type of economic impact analysis that asks about sort of retaining um dollars sort of within a geographic space i mean there's also i mean an analog concept that, that's often discussed about, you know, retaining uh, money sort of within the black community exactly. or retaining yeah. money, you know, within Roxbury. I mean, from, from the point of view of, of something like Roxbury, I, I mean, we don't have, um, I mean, we don't have the, the type of sort of spending data sort of on, on either of those to, to be able to, to come up with the type of estimates we have here. We, we don't have the sort of detailed breakdown of, of the different spending patterns of, of uh, Boston residents of color versus, uh, you know, other Boston residents or, or other. So, so in some ways that, that was sort of a limitation of the data about what type of economic impact analysis we could do. Um, so for those other, you know, for the other, for, for uh, the people of color and, and, and women, I mean, I think we could include the direct impact in this analysis. I mean, that's also, I mean, you know, I think what, what you know, Chris showed, uh, uh, um, you know, is is the sort of tracking of those those gaps. Um, I mean, I think is is something that that I think you know, on a sort of consistent basis, you know, producing all of those numbers. I mean, I think in, in this, yeah, I and mean, that was really just a data limitation for why that was the focus of the the sort of indirect impact analysis here. But but yeah, I fully acknowledge that that all all three of the requirements are are sort of you know of of equal importance. Yeah. And I wonder if you could do an impact analysis that's not like maybe you take it out of the frame from doing like an economic impact, which <laughs> like cents and dollars, but it is one that's like looking at like racial impact or gender. I, you know, I think there may be another way to construct. I think you went on. I'm sorry, Louis Jean, you went on mute again. Oh, sorry. I think this is an incredible analysis. Like, I think it shows us in dollars what we're missing out on. But I think that there are ways to envision, like, you know, you give us something and now I'm asking for more, right? But I think there are different ways for us to do it along. Um, and, I, and I'll leave that to you, and I think that you probably can think about how we do a, a similar analysis, even though it's not, it doesn't have to be an economics, but um, 
based on on race and gender. So I'd love I'd love to see that further. Um, and then I have two other questions, Matt. Um, did you look at did you look at any sort of sort of further data disaggregation, or could you look at, at, and could I'm not asking you to. I'm saying is it possible to look at further dis data disaggregation based on public and private projects? Um, yeah, no, I mean that's available. Um, yeah, I, I mean certainly that that's available in, in the data as as to yeah whether the gaps are bigger on the public and, and private projects. I, um, yeah, no, I mean, we could incorporate that into this analysis as, as well, yeah. And, and then also, are you able to do it for projects that are union versus non-union? Um, I mean, I think, I, I think the, I mean, I think yes, but, but I, I mean, I think there's some question about some of the, the data that we were drawing on from older, I, I mean, I, I think the, the, Completeness of that field may be, may be sort of improving over time. So some of the older data, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think going forward, I, I think that the um, the data for that is 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 stronger. Um, but yeah, we, we we can, you know, that that was something we looked at in, in this, and in and, and and I think you know can can think about incorporating more as we as we go forward. Okay, and then and then I have a a, a, a follow-up question for you, Matt, regarding just like the overall analysis that you did, um, and you know you you do the research, so you're not necessarily the one coming up with sort of solution policy solutions or ideas, but you do have some um, some takeaways, and you mentioned them here, and they're in this report. So I'm wondering if you could sort of further underline what you think, um, or if this could also be you, Jody. What are some of the like concrete solutions that we're thinking about when we see this this which i think is like a jarring number of 23 percent when we have a goal of 51 percent you know we always throw madison park into the conversation um we you know but just wondering like what are the we did this and this is incredible this is an incredible economic impact analysis of showing like what we as a city of boston are losing um what are some of the concrete ways that that we're that we can correct yeah I mean, I'll probably pass some of that off to Jody, um, but but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think you know the the analysis sort of emphasizes the importance of closing the gaps. It isn't, it doesn't speak as as directly to, to what we might sort of do about that. And so so I, I think you know some of the other. I mean, I think I, Jody might be able to cover a little bit better, better that, that side of the question. So I think that's kind of, you know, the analysis is really about emphasizing the importance and sort of, you know, to, then focusing on that question of, of, of what it is that, that we can do about it. I'm going to let jo uh, Jody answer that question, and then I just want to note for the record that your timer has gone off, Councillor Luigian, so I can bring you back for round two so we can allow our colleagues to go through the first round, okay? Jody, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, I think um, it's really one of the first big strategies is moving the Boston Resident Jobs Policy into the Office of Worker Empowerment, which also includes the Office of Workforce Development, to really be intentional about creating those pathways for construction jobs. And um, I'll say that we're in a very unique place right now, which um, we recognize, and that is there is millions of dollars being vested into the transition to a clean energy economy. And we are taking that very seriously. Um, we are launching a new workforce needs assessment, which is gonna identify where those jobs are, what the um, pathways to those jobs, the upskilling that is needed to get people into these jobs. And our office is doing that analysis specifically so we can develop those um, interventions to ensure that Boston residents and people of color in Boston who've been historically um, more impacted by the environmental injustice of, of the climate change um, and to ensure that there's a pathway to those jobs. So I think that big picture, connecting Boston resident jobs policy into the larger strategies, um, and then on a smaller scale, as you said, we, we're really trying to increase what we're doing in terms of compliance. And um, even though we can't, um, we can't sanction folks for not meeting those 
guidelines, we can sanction them for not meeting the administrative guidelines that we have laid out. And we have started that process and we are trying to do it in a very thoughtful and intentional way and collect data in a way that allows us to point towards where those trends are so we can be strategic about it. And I really want to commend the, the staff of the Boston Resident Jobs Policy for their really thoughtful approach and um, Chris in particular around the payroll scan, which is just giving us more information around how we can be doing that. And I think one of the other things is as we find folks, we want to make sure that the funds that are coming in as a result of those fines, we find ways to target that directly towards building those pipelines. And I hope that that answers. I think, you know, we have a lot more to do and there's so much more we can and should be doing. Um, but we have a unique opportunity with the Green New Deal to, to really ensure that we're doing it in a way that builds pathways for Boston residents. Thank you, Jody, um, and thank you, Councilor Luigi. And I'll come back to you for round two. If you don't mind, we're going to keep moving. So I'm going to go next to Councilor Rorel from District 4. You now have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the administration. Um, very import informative, data-driven um, presentation that was um, eye-opening. Um, I know we always talk about economic impact, but to see that it's actually $60 million in wages and 600 jobs, um, you know, just eye-opening and you know, pretty stunning. I, I, I have a question on, this is for you, Chris, on um, slide, I think it was 25. Um, it, it, it broke down um, the active projects by department um, for the city of Boston. I was wondering if we could do the same for private, right? If we could break that down on the private side to see what, um, how, how each company, right? Because if we could do it by like the mayor's office of housing um, has 25% Boston res, well, whatever, whatever the numbers was, if we could do that by, um, for the private side. Um, absolutely. Um, I think for the private projects, um, uh, most of those, it, it, it should be fairly easy. Um, I can, um, I can run it by the, um, the IT, um, administrator that we have, but most of the private projects are, well, all of them are over a hundred thousand square feet. Uh, they're all the, the private projects. So it should be fairly easy to come up with, um, your request. Awesome. And, and I would love that information and, and you know, um, It'll be company and then, you know, the, the, the three categories that you have listed out, uh, residency, women, and then people of color hours. Absolutely. All right. Um, in Duke, uh, Chair, can I make that request through you to, to request from the administration? Yes, please. Awesome. Note it. Um, and um, I just want to also just echo uh, Council Louis Jen's um, comments on, um, you know, we saw, we saw the data. Um, just want to make sure that please consider me um, an ally. I'm making sure that the structures are in place and investments are being made um, to, to, to address the impacts that we're seeing here um, through, um, you know, these jobs not coming into our community. And, and um, whatever I need to do or whatever the council, uh, we have a budget process coming up. Uh, so Jody and team, like whatever investments need to be made to make sure that we're um, investing in that pipeline um, for our communities to be part of the green new um, economy, um, please, please let us know. Um, that, that's all my questions for now, Chair. Um, thank you to the administration again. Thank you, Councilor Worrell. I'm going to move on now to President Flynn. Uh, you now have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, thank you to the administration team that is here. Listen closely to every speaker and I want to say thank you for the professionalism and how important you take your job and how critical your job is to future of Boston. So I just want to say thank you to uh, these dedicated employees. Um, let, let, me, let me ask um, JC um, on, on, on the enforcement aspect, what are, what are some of the unique challenges we have as a city in terms of enforcing the current policy? Thank you for the question, President Flynn. Um, and the major challenge we have is that all of our ability to um, provide either an incentive 
or or fine, right? It's either a carrot or a stick is limited to administrative, uh, meeting administrative requirements, um, whether they can submit payroll on time, whether a company or subcontractor or general contractor can submit payroll on time, whether they can make a meeting on time, where they can um, have all their ducks in a row, which is all administrative in, in, in part. Um, and it leaves out the smaller contractors that are here in the city, um, because they don't have the administrative kind of wraparound support that they need to participate. In this also we don't have the ability to provide any type of penalty uh, or incentive or incentivize contractors they are not meeting the boss of residence numbers or the people of color or women i think the only thing only tool we have at, the, at our disposal at this point in time is if in fact we will identify those companies or those contractors that have had a history of not meeting their requirements, the, the, the numeric requirements, I should say, they may, they may meet the administrative, but the numeric requirements, uh, that we could maybe identify them and put their name forward to um, other agencies where they may not get another contract, right? That's the only kind of thing that we've done. And we have not leveraged that muscle yet. We haven't flexed it yet. We think that we still need to spend more time in, in having conversation with them. We also are just missing out on a huge opportunity to develop a pipeline. The pipeline of people, people want to work. Um, kids want to be involved in th something that's really, really cool. Um, and I'm just going to shout out a building that we have in our skyline right now that I, I bet if we would have invited in differently, would have looked differently. So that the Boston University, you know, Lego stack building that's stacked kind of oblong shape and they're cantilevers that you can see hang out. Not a kid in the city wouldn't have wanted to be involved in that, how they would have known what it would turn out to be. And so we have a huge opportunity to change our culture on job sites and invite in a workforce of kids that know that they can be involved in something that's innovative and it's something that will last 100 years even beyond their time here with us in, in the city of Boston. Thank you for the question. Thank you, JC. And I guess I just have one follow-up question. I guess it would be to JC again, and thank you for your answer. It was very, very helpful explaining, explaining the situation to me. Um, and listening to your comments, well, 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 let me start. Let me start. Oh, let me start back. So, if a if a company is not meeting, not meeting the policy, um, and you know maybe maybe it's coming close to it um, and is trying their best to to reach it. But if there's a, another company that just does not care about the policy at all, um, that's that's who I'm more concerned with. But would, would, would that company that just doesn't care about the policy that is not even making an effort or an attempt, would that company, and, and I know you referenced it, but would that company still be able to bid on city or state contracts? Um, as it stands right now, they would. There's they, not a, they would be able to participate on city projects and or projects in the city uh, without any type of list that we have the lawyer identify that. We do treat those two scenarios very differently. Even mm -hmm. if you have observed the Boston Employment Commission, we have our monthly meetings, we certainly can tell and identify. We've asked for um, kind of a, a backlog, or not a backlog, but a snapshot of uh, three to 12 months of pitch we on a particular contractor so we can identify their trends and how, um, and how they're working currently as well as three years worth of um, engagement in the city so that we understand again their history and their strategies or lack thereof to actively participate in meeting our requirements. So we do take that into consideration but there is not a single thing at this moment that we could do to prevent them from getting additional work. Well what, th 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 thank, thank you JC and um... And my final comment, really not a question, is when this was enacted in 1986 under, under Mayor Flynn and the Boston City Council, um, would you consider or would city officials consider implementing um, part of the policy where if a company just is, 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 con is evading this ordinance, is not following through, is going out of their way, not even to be helpful. Could we amend the, or enact something in the Employment Commission that would preclude someone from bidding on city or even state uh, projects? Um, maybe just thinking out loud, is that something we could do down the road? 
Um, we have, we as the Boston Employment Commission have in fact asked staff to help us re-review, uh, including the legal department and how we can strengthen our current ordinance that would allow us to um, enact exactly what you would do, that a, a history of performance or lack of performance of meetings policies that are uh, grossly negligent, right, which is what we're really looking for, those that are just not really caring about it, not trying, not making any attempt whatsoever, that they be excluded from, from that. Well, well, thank you, JC, for um, answering my questions. Thank you for your professionalism, and um, I have no further questions. Thank you, President Flynn. Um, and I just want to note that our office has been in communication and in partnership um, with the uh, commission, in fact, to uh, work on revising and updating. Um, we, have, we have made some progress on that front and we're looking forward to uh, moving things forward. Jody, I know there's been some transitions and some fits and starts, but I'm um, Trin and I have been in communication um, in, in the previous term, um, we had a draft ordinance uh, that was in the works. And so we have been working with the uh, building trades as well to make sure that, you know, it reflects the needs of everyone. And I think, um, JC, now that you are in this position, you know, I think it's a good time for us to resuscitate that work. And um, I will make sure um, my chief of staff, Luce, is here listening in um, that we get you a copy of the initial draft. Um, and to Councillor Flynn, you're more than welcome to join us as a co-sponsor in that work because that is definitely the direction that we have been moving in anyways to update the, um, the ordinance so that it can reflect the moment. So let's do that good work so that we can move um, in the direction that we need to go in. So I'll make sure, JC and Jody, since you're coming in on this front too, that we can um, keep doing the people's business. So I'll make sure that you all get a copy of that draft. Sounds good. Thank, thank you, Council Mayor. Absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna move on now to Councilor Breeden. You now have five minutes and the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everyone. Um, some of my colleagues have already touched on some of my questions. Um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in how we are developing pipelines for our students in, public, in our schools. And I'm wondering what sort of partnerships we have with the building trades um, and our high schools across the city, not just um, Madison Park, to increase awareness of careers in construction and construction pipelines um, and opportunities for apprenticeships going forward. And then the other question I had was really with regard to returning citizens and whether we are working with um, you know, the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department or other um, agencies to work on pipelines to help reduce recidivism of folks who, uh, you know, need need to get back into society and be able to have productive lives. And we're, we're I, you know, when I hear the, the, the data that we haven't really moved the dial too much in decade on decade on decade, we have to sort of step it up a little here and see what, what other folks would benefit from um, these opportunities. For so long, the narrative was that you weren't making it if you didn't go to college. You know, you had to be, you had to go to college. You had to go to college. And, and that's such a destructive sort of narrative for folks who a college career, a college approach is maybe not the best, you know, it does, not everyone is suited to that. And there's lots of really good and rewarding and well-being jobs in, in other industries that don't require a college degree. A strong apprenticeship program offers a lot. Um, and there's no, there's no shame in working with your hands and, and uh, working in construction. There's this, this that sort of narrative that if you're not doing a white collar job in, in an office, it is, it's, you know, so I, I want to get away from that sort of narrative, that negative uh, view of folks who uh, work in the trades, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, your, your thoughts would be helpful. Um, we are excited about schools like the Boston Green Academy here in, Bo in, in Brighton that's working on jo new pipelines into, into the green new, the green, um, Green New Deal sort of jobs, and we're really excited about uh, the Boston, um, the the Boston, what is it, the core um, for all the jobs in in um, 
the green green infrastructure jobs uh, as well. So, and any of your thoughts would be really helpful. Thank you. I can say from the contractor's perspective, having um, pursuing projects in the city, that the prescription for contractors, the opportunity for con contractors to go into our schools is wide open. All the schools um, would love that type of participation. There are some schools that lend themselves to um, kind of guide the students through to a careers in construction or construction related. Um, I have been an, an advocate in suggesting that we need to look at the entire construction professional, not just the not just the, uh, the workforce that's on the project site, but there's opportunities for people to estimate construction projects, for them to learn how to schedule them, for them to learn how to do the accounting, job cost accounting. There's an array of construction related jobs that also helped to move the needle that would interest our current um, views. They're, they're high, highly technical. They are really technical kids. They're learning a lot more than we will ever know about um, how to use technology. And so to show them that that can be applied to a construction career or construction related career is um, really important. I think that there are um, contractors as part of their strategy will identify their pathways to, to working with uh, particular schools, primarily high schools, um, but there's certainly more work that needs to be done in exposing um, our youth really as early as kindergarten to this. I, and I want to give this a um, kind of a, a plug for my daughter's school. She attended the international school in kindergarten. They actually built a city, a city, they built a city where above the city they had, they out of cardboard, the kids made buildings and churches and synagogues and temples and everything else. And below that, they, they built uh, infrastructure. They built pipes um, out of um, paper towel holders so that they could see and understand how what would happen below the streets. I mean, that type of engagement with our youth, there's, there are highly sophisticated strategies to get them to do that, but then there are also tangible ones like the one I described now that can be done um, that allows kids to really kind of engage themselves and see themselves as being part of a larger community and in a career that is, as you've mentioned, um, Commissioner, that is a very high paying career that will allow them to stay into the city that can help in reducing all of our uh, wealth gap conversations that we're having as well. So there's so many indirect, uh, I'll take the word from Matt, in the indirect um, opportunities that will allow us to, to do that. But largely these are volunteer in many ways. Contractors are becoming very innovative in developing their pipeline. We have moved the commerce largely because we've we've asked them to become innovative. We've asked them how can you, what else can you do? Do not just sit and do the norm. The Boss Employment Commission wants to hear your, your strategies in what it is that you're doing. So they've done that. We also have asked them to look at hiring more or think about how they can hire more black and brown and indigenous um, and female-led construction companies because there's a direct multiplier in those categories of demographic of people and who they hire as their workforce professionals. So while we're not exactly tracking that, um, there would, we had a different story during the Big Dig. Big Dig was a different story and, and that was a, a universal challenge in trying to sustain people that were working then. Now we do, we are seeing that the female-led women, uh, people of black, brown, indigenous, people that are leading companies hire more of the workforce, a more of a diverse workforce. Thank you. If I, then, okay to add, um, oh, Madam Chair? Okay, I see you all getting here. Okay, Jody, I'm gonna let you answer. And I know Council Breeden, you have one more question. I think you have one more question, but I also wanna be respectful of everyone. The, the other question was about returning citizens as, as yeah. part of the... Make yeah. sure, yeah. Make sure you guys get that in, and then Jody and um, JC, you you're both um, able to answer that. That would be great. Okay. So Jody, why don't you jump in with your comments, and then Jody, if you have any, um, sure. reflect on returning citizens. Okay, JC. Sure, Jody. sure. Um, so I want just in terms of partnerships with the Office of Returning Citizens here and Boston Public Schools, um, I can 
detail some of that and provide it to the city council if that would be helpful. Um, I know that one thing that we really work on here that in, in work empowerment is the opportunity to provide pre-apprenticeship programs. We know that those pre-apprenticeship programs allow people to be more successful in the apprenticeship programs and that's what that um, grant is all about. I also want to say that there's another side to this which is that the infrastructure bill has um, tax incentives for developing apprenticeship programs. We are looking very closely at those and we are trying to build out our capacity support to support contractors who want to pursue creating those apprenticeship opportunities and get those tax incentives. So we're working very hard to understand what's in the infrastructure bill and understand how we can support the flip side of building more of those apprenticeship opportunities. So there is, um, so because we know there's more people who want apprenticeships than there are apprenticeships available. Yeah, Madam Chair, one more one more comment or question. Um, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for uh, English as a second language classes in the city, and I know that the Office of Workforce, you know, your office, uh, the Neighborhood House, Neighborhood Jobs Trust, does fund uh, English language classes. But my concern is, and one one thing is, is a certain level when folks are new or they speak little or no English that there's very few buckets that we can go to to get money from to start those you know introductory survival level english to get the first rung on the ladder there's lots of money for give more money for a job for classes for folks who've got more a higher level of english uh, and you're increasing their proficiency so that they can be better more able ready for jobs the job market but I really, um, I'll put a plug in. Uh, I'll beat all the bushes to get some more money for those really, those very basic, no folks who come with no English. They may come, they might already be, be have a, had a, a job as in construction or something before they got here, but they don't speak any English, and and we don't have, we don't have enough classes like here at the Jacks at the uh, the. Uh, the Gardner Pilot Academy has a has a, a very a, a good English language program for parents, and we they have a wait list of fifty people for the basic no, like no little or no English level classes, and and the folks build on those skills and they progress and they become entrepreneurs and they start their own businesses and they do all sorts of great stuff, but. We need to do a little pump priming priming in that particular area with regard to putting some money into that bucket and i'd love to see and i think a little you get a lot of bang for your buck uh, in those in that space so i'm advocating for a little more money for for the, those and there might be some federal restrictions on how that money can be spent or state restrictions but some more money for the folks that have little or no english would be really helpful thank you if i could just add on to that very quickly chair um so the returning citizens um are certainly being part of the process, as, as uh, Director Shigman Bronson mentioned, that they're definitely being brought into fields where uh, they can, into the different specific trades, and that's happening at the pre-apprentice level, ship level, as well as the apprenticeship level. I would like to say, though, that um, as a construction company owner and entrepreneur, uh, a shameless plug, but we are certainly working at how we're bringing people along from analog to really AI in the construction industry, and specifically when it comes to clean energy. So I have launched um, a construction accelerator that's specifically looking at wraparound support services for smaller construction companies so that they can have a pathway to clean energy projects. And those clean energy projects really are defined by everything we're building right now. It's the infrastructure, it's the housing projects that both have been identified at a state or a commonwealth, as well as a city level. Um, it is the commitments that we're making to innovation at all of our universities. It, there is, at some point in time, um, a huge need to, to get people trained in understanding what clean energy is, because it is the pathway for the future. We will be less dependent upon carbon uh, and fuel processes, and I need to cut at this point in time, I'm giving the cue, but there's less uh, dependency on that and more on looking at clean energy. Thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Thank Very you. good. Thank and you. thank you, Councillor Breeden. I, I, I extended you additional grace as um, um, just because. I appreciate um, that. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> but I don't want to be called out by my colleagues for giving you a little extra time that I didn't give anyone else. So I'm going to reel you in here. Um, so I'm just curious. I don't see Councillor. Um, 
Murphy with us, but I believe we have been joined by Councillor at Large Flaherty. And that being said, Councillor Flaherty, you are more than welcome to utilize this time slot to make your remarks, um, opening, or ask any questions. Councilor Good, thank you, Madam Chair. I had some connectivity issues earlier, so I've been off and on. But so I, I just uh, I'd be remiss if I don't mention uh, the sort of the forefathers, uh, specifically uh, former and late Councillor uh, Bruce Bowling. In his, uh, this was his brainchild, of course, along with a partnership uh, with our former mayor, Ray Flynn, that made this a reality. And then uh, colleagues along the way, and particularly Councillor Chuck Turner, Councillor Charles Giancy, and Councillor Michael Ross, uh, led efforts along the way to strengthen it, to increase the percentages, uh, and to push it from sort of goals and objectives to uh, more in a policy sector. So I uh, wanted to give uh, all those uh, individuals a shout out for their work um, on this. Uh, they were in the space before there was, I guess, space. Um, that said, I wanted to ask the panel their thoughts. Uh, a couple things, making sure that the bench, in terms of the, uh, our, our partners in the trades, um, I don't know whether or not they have access to the census data, but to see whether or not they're keeping pace uh, with the percentages in their respective unions, which ones are doing better than others and which ones are falling short, and how do we help that partner union uh, increase um, you know, their capacity within that respective union to be able to meet the goals and objectives here, number one, two. Are you guys encountering any issues with the work from home phenomenon? I know it's happening in the private sector. We're also seeing it in some public sector jobs. Clearly, with respect to the construction side of the house, you don't get to work on a construction site from home. Uh, but the cost of living here in Boston, as well as the cost of daycare, child care, and education uh, has put a lot of folks in a conundrum as to whether or not they take the job or uh, they move to another form of employment that allows them to work from home one day a week, two days a week, possibly work from home for the whole week. So I'm curious as to whether or not you're factoring that in. It will be, if not, it's already um, an issue for the city. It will be hitting our tax base probably in the next couple of years. We're seeing on the commercial property side of the house, um, firms, companies are taking less square footage when they're renewing their leases. That's critical funds that we as a city depend on to, for, for our schools, for our parks and playgrounds and libraries and trash collection, uh, snow removal, street cleaning, police, fire, EMS, et cetera. So I just want to see whether or not you have incorporated sort of that issue into your lens on the uh, census side of the house for the trades in the work from home conundrum that we're facing uh, as a city. And thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Can I take this one? I'll be brief this time. I think I, I'm causing the problem on people going over on time. So <laughs> really briefly, um, as a signatory contractor, which I am, they the unions are not uh, sharing all of their data about the people on the bench. So we don't know exactly how their numbers stack up. There are certainly um, efforts for all of the um, unions in their own ways of, of providing a pathway so that they can um, have more of a diverse bench of people, as you're exactly right, that are, that, are, that are able to work on our projects, but we don't we don't have that data, they don't share that data with us openly. Um, what we do know is that there are some, uh, I'll just say two, when there may be more, of, so I want to say to all my colleagues in the unions, I apologize if I didn't identify your your, your union in, in, in some way, but we do know that the, the electricians and the carpenters specifically are recruiting, uh, they tell us they're recruiting more diverse group of class entering every year than they've ever had before. Um, so for those two trades, we know specifically, but the others, we don't, we know that those numbers are growing. Uh, the, the others, we don't know as much, um, have as much data on the, on the others. Jody, do you want to um, answer? Do you have any insight? Or Councillor uh, Flaherty, if you have a uh, follow-up. You still have time left. I just wanted to note that for the record. Yeah, I think um, Chair Burton has already talked about you know, challenges with sometimes getting that, that data. I might add the iron workers to your list of we know diverse, more diverse classes as well. Um, and I think that our jobs bank is making a very concerted effort to reach out to all the apprenticeship programs to ensure that the folks who are reaching out to us at the jobs bank have an opportunity to, to really um, be part of the apprenticeship pipeline that our union partners have have connected and, and you know it's, and I think um, manager Brown can say a little bit more but we are trying to be more intentional about collecting the data on which projects are union or non-union so that when we present our data um, we can have a little bit more of an understanding of what 
um, where union versus non-union um, are succeeding in meeting our hiring goals. Thank you. And I see, JC, you have your hand up. Round two, go. I do have a secondary thought that uh, I'd like to, to bring to the conversation. I do know that our community colleges, Ben Franklin Cummings Institute of Technology, as well as Rockbury, Roxbury Community College, have very aggressive and wonderful pre-apprentice training and trade training programs that are trying to have a meaningful conversation with the trades, with the uh, um, with the organized union uh, trade representatives that they, can, they too can have their students fit right into um, the apprenticeship or pre-apprenticeship programs. And so I, I don't want, I would be remiss to make sure that I am um, not thinking about the entire lens of what's happening in the city, but our community colleges are certainly partners in this effort as well. Thank you. And then does anyone have any thoughts sort of on that, uh, sort of, I guess, the work from home? And I know that we as a city, we've got a lot of job openings. I know the state has a lot of job, job openings. In places like the MBTA, back in the day, you, know, you got a job on the T, um, you know, you're arguably set for life, uh, good job, good wages, good benefits, good pension. Uh, even the MBTA is having a difficult time um, filling um, um, vacancies. So are we seeing that um, sort of across the board in the city? Uh, and are we seeing obviously with our trades where again, there are options. People now have options, uh, particularly on the stay at home and uh, the daycare um, and the education side of the house, which is th those are major factors as to whether or not you take a job. It's the cost of living. It's the uh, cost of rents and mortgages in Boston, coupled with the fact that you've got some daycare uh, issues uh, and or in need of good quality, affordable daycare, as well as you didn't get the school of your choice, so uh, you're deciding to educate your child. It could be a private or parochial setting. All of those factor into whether or not you want to work for the city of Boston and or you want to go to work for um, you know, a trade that has, uh, that's adhering to the Boston residency job policy. Are you guys seeing difficulty um, hiring folks? And I, I dovetail that into the residency program. We've seen we've been sort of lax and backing off of the residency requirement for city employees and uh, an absolute travesty. We have a responsibility here uh, to preserve the middle class in Boston. We're becoming the city of the very rich and the very poor. The middle class is what keeps our neighborhoods functioning in terms of our civic associations, our churches, our youth sports programs. We need the middle class uh, and we need families to stay in Boston. This is a big piece of this. When we see the city of Boston uh, having vacancies that are not being filled and then they waive the residency requirement, that job now goes to someone that does not live in Boston, that does not spend their hard earned dollars at a local uh, convenience store or a bodega or participating at their local civic association or their local church. All of those factor into you know, um, you know, keeping our city the greatest city in America. And so I wanna make sure that we have a lens towards uh, and focusing on sort of the work from home conundrum as well as you know when we have to um, move away from the residency requirement to fill a slot. When I always argue we've got the best and the brightest right here in Boston. We've got the best college and universities, hospitals. I mean, we're a magnet for talent. And, it, uh, you know, why can't we fill these slots? Uh, is it the pay scale? Uh, is it the affordability piece? So there's a lot of factors that go into it. I know you guys look at it, um, you know, every day. So I just want to see what your thoughts were on that. And again, thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to the panel for the work that you've done on this. Yes, and I want to be considerate of the time allotment that we provided all of our colleagues. So I just would love if either JC or Jody are just kind of like high level. And I think this is definitely a conversation that um, we should continue having outside of this, you know, required biannual um, hearing. I think that the real work happens when we're not doing this, right? So let's make sure that we add that as part of a deliverable that we can all agree upon to work collaborative yeah. outside of the space. So Jody or JC, just kind of high level, please. Thank you. Yes, high level. So we did see a, a definite downturn during the pandemic of women and parents just in general trying to get to construction sites. I too was a woman trying to teach my child fourth grade and get to a construction site. It was very challenging at times. She often learned from the back of the car. Um, but at other times, there were the, what we've seen is that that has kind of bounced back. We have seen all of the work that this council has done on providing child care support to child care providers, as well as um, at your partner with the, with the Commonwealth, providing pathways for legislation and flexibility for child care providers that we have not seen um, as much of a flat flattening out as now for peer, people that need child care to need to get to job sites as it was during the pandemic. That has, uh, I don't want to say completely eradicated itself because people have certainly gotten comfortable with staying at home. So I'm sure there's a number that the researcher can be able to figure out for us. 
um, about how we what we what we may have lost or jobs lost the people not wanting to return to construction. I think what we have is an opportunity to really change the culture of construction and be more inclusive uh, visually and openly that would attract folks into the industry. All right. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. I am going to open it up for round two. So if you have additional questions, I see your hand, Councillor Rorel. I am going to do round two. I have yet to ask my question. So if you don't mind holding, Councillor Rorel, that um, I would appreciate that. And I have not asked my questions before we move on to round two. I'll be doing that. Okay. So, and I will, in the interest of making sure I am being equitable and accountable, I will be putting myself on a timer. Here we go. All right, so really quick, I'm just really curious. Um, I'd love to get some insight of, around the communication and feedback loop. I'm really curious to hear kind of what information, if any, is provided to those folks who don't land a job or a contract. I really would love to know explicitly how we're handling that communication loop. I didn't hear that in the presentation. And if you did say it, maybe my daughter interrupted me while you were talking about it, but I need to hear it again. I'm also curious and I'm happy to hear that you identified some of my, um, some of the folks that I see in the building trades that are really making a concerted effort to increase their diversity. In fact, um, local um, IBW 103 is one of the unions that I have really have spent most of my time with learning alongside them and really value how dedicated they are to increasing their diversity goals. Um, in fact, I've been to lots of their re apprentice and recruitment and just it's like amazing to see that effort. Um, so would love to hear if you could name some of the um, unions that we can provide a little bit more technical assistance and a little bit more nudging just to, to know which ones, we know which ones are doing really well. It'd be helpful to hear which ones we all can embrace a little bit more and provide them a little bit more of a push or a gentle nudge these days. You gotta use your language carefully. Um, I'm also curious if you don't mind, um, would be helpful for me to understand a better, uh, I know, you know, I always been talking about this dashboard since the beginning of time here, but I'm curious as we break down the data, I am hap I'm ha I'm curious to hear more like those folks who are who have on-site jobs, those who are who are behind the scenes, the rate of pay for individuals who are of color. I think that it's one thing to get us in the door, fill that quota, check mark is all good, but I'd love to see where 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 are people landing in terms of the pay scale. And then there is this whole understanding that there are a lot of uh, minority owned contractors and developers out there who absolutely are being left out because of the highest bidder, the lowest bidder clause. And I know that's hard to contend with, but I'm just curious what if any solutions you think we can do some work around. I know there's been some traction around there and breaking up the contracts, but I'm just curious about how we're, how we're moving in, in that uh, direction. And then I think that the last question that is, you know, that I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about um, is the one thing is that what I've heard this before and I can't confirm nor deny this, but I'm just putting it out here because it's what I've heard out in these streets is that sometimes they, you know, when you have a job, you hire uh, people of color, but they don't stay on to the end of the project. Um, and I'm just curious if there's any data of the, um, the livelihood of a contract that is minority or women owned, do they see it to completion? At what point do we lose them? Is there any data around that? It, it'd be helpful to know the lifespan of a person of color working in this space so that we can understand what we need to do to fix it. So with that, I am going to let you all answer. Thank you. I can, I can start um, with the communications. I think you've hit a real challenge. I know that our, our jobs 
bank coordinator oftentimes will refer people to a contractor and um, sometimes we don't hear back. Were they hired? Were they not hired? If they weren't hired, why not? That's something she's working very concernedly on, but it's a gap that we need to, to fix because it's been um, challenging to identify which strategies are working and which strategies aren't working because we don't get that feedback information. Um, but we are working on trying to improve that. Um, I think the question regarding which unions we want to nudge, I think the data that Matt presented earlier of which trades, um, that, that should give us a little bit of um, incentive to prioritize our partnerships with different unions. So I really, um, you know, we looked at that really closely and, and I'll, I'm hoping that will help, especially as we move towards building the pathways to the, the new Green New Deal jobs that we want to make sure that, that we're using that that yeah, Jody, no, just, just to be clear on that, it's just kind of like in terms of what the city has done to already provide some nudging and what else can we be doing to help support that? Yeah, I, I, I'm, that's a really good question. I'm not sure how much nudging besides partnering with our pre apprenticeship programs. Um, I think it's a real important piece of what we're trying to do with building the pathways to the Green New Deal. Um, and that is something that's very much a, a priority for the Worker Empowerment Office. Um, the dashboard, I'm really glad. I'm sorry, Councillor Mejia hadn't brought that up in my presentation, but we do, our Director of Research and Evaluation is working on a dashboard that's not just construction specific, but sort of overall jobs in Boston. And she's been collecting data points and information and is going to have a proposal for what that'll look like. So it'll be a dashboard for Boston residents and jobs generally, um, including the construction industry. But that is something uh, that Chief Nguyen has instructed her to, to, to build out. Um, and I did the, the lowest bidder. I want to go back to something that um, Councillor Flynn mentioned, which is that we do, and, and Chair Burton said this, we do have the ability to list, um, create a list of contractors who are not meeting the Boston Resident Jobs Policy Goals, and also who have wage theft violations as part of our wage theft executive order. That is not something we've done yet comprehensively, but that is something that the Office of Labor Compliance and Worker Protections is working really closely on. So do they have to use that information when bidding? No, but they can. And we are hoping to at least provide that data so that there is a level playing field um, for some of those um, contractors that are doing right by the workers, who are protecting the workers, paying them properly, hiring Boston residents and people of color. So that's something we've been looking really closely at in the Office of Labor Compliance and trying to figure out how we can build a, a database or a data tool that our procurement and contracting staff can use to really, to really check on that. Um, and then finally on the, the hiring folks at the beginning who don't stay on till the end, we do have projects that come before the Boston Employment Commission come at 10% and Chris and, and Commissioner and Chair Burton, you'll have to make sure I have this right, but I think it's 10, 50, 75%. So when they come before us, we're seeing them at different points throughout the project. So we can really see where their numbers are. That is only the projects that come before the back and is um, the, Manager um, Chris Brown has showed that's that's not everybody. That's why we've started doing the payroll scans to give a broader picture. Um, but we do see those projects at different levels that come before the back at different points, and we have the ability to check their status along the way. Thank you. And, I, 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 and because I want to be uh, fair, uh, JC, and if you have any additions that you want to add, then I'm going to move on to a second round of questions in, uh, in order of arrival. Thank you. Yes, just to supplement uh, what Director Truman Brazel has identified. So the trades that we are seeing um, that are early to the project that cause us the, the, at that 10% mark where we're not necessarily meeting our expectations are typically, and this is not all projects, but certainly more frequently, are plumbers and gas fitters, are our utility um, providers, or util um, utility unions specifically, um, and that are elevators. So th those, if there are any ones that could have a little nudge or be incentivized or encouraged or supported in their effort to uh, think about how they are, are working would be those four. There are probably others, but I want to just identify those as the ones that we have, have seen that typically historically would match 
the data and show that they have the least amount of participation with Boston residents, people of color, and women. Thank you, and I'm going to stop asking questions at fairness. So I'm going to go back to a second round. I know we do have some folks who are also signed up for public testimony, so I also want to be respectful of, the, of that. So I'm going to go back to the lead sponsor, um, Councillor Louis Jen, then followed by Councillor Worrell, followed then by President Flynn and Liz Braden, and then myself. Councillor Louis Jen, you now have the floor. Thank you, and I also have heard from Councillor Fernandez Anderson, who's a co-sponsor on this as well, who I believe was trying to make it. I'm not sure she's going to, but just wanted to put that out there. And also, I think Jody, you had mentioned the uh, issue of worker safety and how there are folks signing up. I'd also just be remiss if, in this space, we don't uplift the worker window washer who passed away um, from a, uh, you know, while working on a skyscraper. I think window washing is one of the most dangerous professions. And um, we need to be thinking about how we how we make it less dangerous here in the city. Um, I had questions uh, for Manager Brown. I think you mentioned when you were showing the data part of the city of Boston um, how we were and weren't complying with certain of uh, the BRJP requirements. Parks seem to have a particular de deficit of about twenty percent people of color. Is there a reason why parks more so, I think that some of the numbers for some of the others were somewhere around 34% or 40% why parks is at 20% when it comes to people of color? Uh, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Councilor. Uh, usually the parks department is a small department. And a lot of contractors that work on those projects are small contractors. It might be a father, a man with a truck, a father and a son, uh, you know, so I would say probably because of the fact of the size of the companies. And again, it could be a man with a truck, could be the father and, and the son. So that's what we see on those type of projects. That's a, that's actually really, um, I appreciate that because when we talk about how we're diversifying the trades and constructions and who gets city contracts, some of the easier and more accessible contracts tend to be those smaller ones, like right? the 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 guy the guy with the truck with that has like a. So I, I'd actually expect and want to see if that's happening for us to do better in that area, um, because those are maybe the lower dollar contracts. Um, you know, our folks have not had businesses for as long as. Oh, as, as white owners, and so we're more likely to be the smaller mom and pop. So just putting that out there, I've, I've heard different folks say this around the city that like those are the contracts that, you know, we make contracts more accessible when we break them down in their smaller bids. So I just think that that could be an area for growth for us to be more intentional in the parks department, for us to be doing work with those guys with the truck in Roxbury and in Dorchester and in High Park and in an area. So, um, just like a call to action, I guess that's, that's what that is. And then, you know, when the, the another number that was interesting, because I, I think previously we've seen that on some of the private projects, um, they've had higher percentages of people of color for a number of reasons. But on this data that you show, the chart actually had a higher percentage of people of color for public projects, which I think is exciting data and information. Is there a reason, do you think, is like, are we seeing a trend? Is there anything behind that? Um, that you know, just, I, I think I commend the city because we, we want to be the example. I think oftentimes it was said that um, for city projects, those are the projects that are more likely to have to be union. And um, those are the ones that also have may have fewer people of color. But if we are seeing city projects increasing their people of color percentage and increasing the and still being high union, that is slightly encouraging to me. Do you think that we have enough data to be drawing that inference, or is this just like a one-off that we're seeing here? Yeah, I think we would have to look into it further. Um, not sure if it's a one-off or not, uh, but I do think in general with the private and the public projects. We do see a lot of uh, the people of color goal is uh, the most uh, obtainable goal that it has been. And that's probably because, you know, you can have a person that, of color that doesn't live in Boston, right? That get counted on the data, but not sure if it's a one off, but I, I think it would, it would require us to look into it further. Thank you. Um, Commit, uh, Chair Burton, I have two questions for you. Thank you for what uh, you've offered. Um, 
One is, I didn't, you were giving an example in the first round when you were speaking of a project that was like meeting the, exceeding the goals. I just didn't catch the name. Can you, can you repeat it for me? I intentionally did not um, oh, identify oh, okay. that. that was the project. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I, I want them to be successful, okay. and, I, and I hope that they are. Um, we'll talk offline about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will happily tell you. Um, it's it's a it's a hospital project. Um, it's Mass General. They've been a great partner in, in with the city. They've made investment. Um, and knowing that they wanted to make sure that they could meet the Boston residence job policy, so the, the asset manager itself, Mass General, has been investing in providing a pipeline so that their project would be successful. And we're seeing the fruit of that development of that. They, they started this work a year before the project started, maybe longer, um, but they are specifically making both financial investment um, as well as driving the ship is, is to, to make sure that we can, can see a product that is reflective of, of what they, the people that they actually care for every day. I think that's awesome, and I and I hopefully will be like drawing lessons from that that I we can apply to other projects. Um, I wonder, you know, there are other questions like it, Mass General is this huge entity, and it, sometimes it, the bigger you are, the easier it is for you to um, to be sort of like the innovative trends that you're talking about. But we, you know, not that it's exclusively so. We can um, there's work we can do to to make that more accessible for smaller projects as well and smaller companies. But um. Uh, I also had, had a question for you regarding, you talked about the fines um, and how we, a lot of times folks are like, you know, that the fines are how they see whether the efficacy of BRJP, even though it's it's not a direct link, you know, it's a proxy. Um, in your opinion, do you see a link between the fining that we're, that the that Beck is finally able, starting to be able to do and the goals of BRJP? Um, so the fine that we're able to do it does not actually really reflect the work that we're trying to do, right? We're trying to have a, a diverse set of people that are in the city to work on projects, right? And we're, and we're saying, let's get them, let's just make it, let's make it equitable. 50% of the people on projects, 51% of people on projects who live in the city, that's just like half. It's not, mm -hmm. we're not saying 85%, we're just saying half. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're saying that the city um, has an issue with, with, it has a long history um, over in its lack of engagement with people of color or fairness of treating people of color working on construction projects. So let's let's make a mark to not identify every single ethnicity on a list, right, which we could, but just say all people of color should be, you know, about 40%. And let's make sure we are helping women um, who, who had their plight in the industry in the 60s and the 70s that get shut out of work for lots of reasons, but mainly just because people don't think that they're capable and qualified of doing the work, let's make sure we are attracting them. So we're not actually able to provide fines in the work that we are, are doing at this point in time. It's really administrative. But you do see that the sometimes we've had uh, hearings around the fines and, and the company that had the, the, the largest fine, the most egregious fine so far, um, their attitude was very challenging. They, they, President Flynn brought up a point earlier about the attitude of people just not caring. They were one that he could write in the book that they were not willing to try to help and have a, a civil conversation around how they could do better or, or what they had done or their reporting mechanisms. Um, they were a contractor that is not based in the city, so they kind of fly into the city, so to speak, do the work, and then they go back. Um, and, and if they can... Can, can come in under the, under, I don't want to say darkness, but they can come in really quickly, get the work done, leave out, they're happy to do that instead of really engaging in the process of trying to find workers or people of color. Uh, and mind you, this is a very sensitive issue as I'm a member of this community, right? These are my trade contractors and subcontractors that I try to hire and work with on the projects that we're working on. And so it's very challenging to, to, um, to find the right types of incentives so that they could, they could meet the goals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chair Burton. Um, I think those are my questions, but I mean, but as you were talking about, like how you are also in this role and how you, you are when you're when you're doing that, you're also thinking about BRJP. We as city councilors, 
you know, I think whenever we get, we get, we have hearings all the time from MSBA that comes for us for funding. And, you know, I always ask questions about BRJP compliance and like, I, I feel like that's not enough, right? But, I, that, you know, that's my opportunity and my avenue to make sure that there are projects that we are doing, that we are being intentional about BRJP, which is also why I'm excited that, you know, our, our, our public numbers seem to be going up, which is encouraging for me. Um, but as city councils, we have we have all these we have some big projects that are on the horizon, right? When you talk about like, the P3 or Dot Ab or Suffolk Downs, um, is there work that we can do or be more intentional on the city council to ensure that these big projects are going to be complying with BRJP or in Chair Burton, the, the example that you mentioned with, with the, the hospital and, and the contractor there really exceeding BRJP goals, especially in neighborhoods that are black and brown neighborhoods where, you know, we have all this development coming that is, you know, trying to straddle the line to ensure that it's not causing displacement, but how are we winning so that, you know, in due time, in two years, when Matt comes back to us with research, uh, that it's not a, we're not at 23%, that we're, you know, maybe capturing 33% or 40%, even if we're not at our 51% goal. And I'm going to just note for the record that I've extended the time. Um, Council Lujan is one of the lead sponsors here. So for those who are tuning in, it's not my playing favorites. I'm also being super mindful of her role here. So with that, if you don't mind answering those, that last question, then I'm going to move on to the second co-sponsor. Thank you, Council Lujan. Um, I'll be really brief. So we, I um, had the wonderful opportunity of trying of, of providing some insight um, to the development authority and thinking about how they incentivize new projects. And one of the things that we that I talked about that I mentioned was that there should be consideration for the direct investment into the pipeline development. Right there, there. This has to be a public-private partnership, and uh, it was really public. Private, private, and we if we count our unions involved in that as well. Um, and so, the, if there was a way to identify uh, projects, small or large, again, and I know that I, the one that I highlighted today was from a very large project, but I can tell you, uh, a year ago this time, I was testifying about a project that was small, that was residential in nature, with a brand new contractor who was using Craigslist to recruit people of color. It was extremely successful. So, we we do want those case studies so that we could have a, a whole range of, of, of ideas. And I would have never thought to use Craigslist. Anyway, I can say that we, we can look at how BPDA maybe can incentivize that by uh, developers having budgetary um, line items, identifying how they're going to um, implement these projects. It's gonna get me in trouble with all the developers because they're all my clients too, but <laughs> having a pathway that they that, that we know we can develop for that because we, we do need the help but in being able to have that financed right there is a page out of the commonwealth book that i can can tell you what this development of um of mass clean energy mass ec clean energy council and they have particularly looked at um grant opportunities for organizations trying to scale and or grow companies to go into clean energy and so there could be a, a play on uh, sustainable sustainable projects, on housing projects, on infrastructure projects that could uh, be very helpful in that. But it is going to take a monetary investment uh, because our current pathways are just not working. Thank you. Uh, Jody, we're good. I'm going to move on to the next. Yeah, great, awesome. Okay, I'm going to move on now to the second co-sponsor, uh, Councillor Burrell. You now have the floor and your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you again to the administration. And um, bringing off of um, Councillor Louis Jen's last question on how we could be more intentional, just seeing the numbers in most of the projects, like the hours that, you know, Chris, that you provided showed that, you know, most of the uh, work being done are in the private sector um, and most of those developers you know come through one of our offices right it's you know coming through one of the district counselor offices asking for support you know it's, it's our community meetings um, that they go to where we have staff at um, so kind of I've, I've just been thinking on like how how do how do we you know you know I, I hear about the timeline but then I think about what Matt presented like we're missing $60 million a year 
right, and wages. And that pipeline is going to take some time to get put in place, some time for, you know, the students to actually graduate. But, you know, every year, I'm not sure if it's every year, but in 2022, you know, that's $60 million. Next year, it could be $40 million. That's a lot of money not coming into our community. So I just want to put you a little bit more, uh, Chair Burton, on, like, is, and I've been thinking about, is it a project labor agreement? Is there an agreement that we could strike here with the developers to kind of get them to say, you know, we're, we, we could hold, hold their feet and hold them more accountable to, to meet some of these goals that, we, that we've out, uh, outlined? Yeah, I think a, a PLA would be very challenging. I think that all projects are not equal. Um, all parts of land that, you're, that they're working with are not equal. And so I think a, P, a universal PLA approach would be really challenging for them to implement. I think some of the projects do have PLA and, and they're still kind of working through them and some don't. Um, I do think that it, it is really being able to um, I mean, they develop the projects that have developer participation at the back are the ones that are most successful. The, where the developers are there, they're committed, they're, they're trying to help the contractor team and the subcontractor team identify pathways to move forward. Those are the ones that we have the most success with. Um, and they are have they have their own policy or incentives. Um, without, I think what we could look at is really thinking about how to engage um, contractors of color and women-owned construction companies because there there is a direct link between the workforce hiring of that and those companies are much smaller they are they are they are tiny on the blip of the size of some of our very large you know, contractors that are doing you know a billion or two billion or two products billion or two annual revenue a year and the largest minority led general contracting company here in here in the commonwealth or even in the city is barely doing a couple hundred million dollars a year that, that's a you know a dwarfism that's the largest that i'm talking about so there's a lot of work to be done in that and helping to prop up minority led firms in a, in a real way uh, by giving them a lot of support so that as they scale they too they are usually like as I said, they're the ones that are hiring the people and, and female-led companies too. And not all, not all minority-led companies are the same, and not all female companies are the same. So I want to just provide a disclosure statement of that some of them are not diverse in their hiring and they're hiring at all, but the majority of them are. Uh, thank you for that, Chair. And I, I know the state has, you know, a list of um, MWBEs. I believe the city has one as well. Um, is there any other database as a city council like we could be directing um, our contractors to saying, you know, here goes a database of subcontractors, contractors that can, um, you know, help? Yeah, so I, I think um, a lot of the MBE companies are, are the smaller ones or are, are ones that are emerging or growing are not all certified yet, right? So there's a, they're incentivizing their certification. And I know that the Office of Economic Development has done that every quarter, I believe, or since they've kind of started to track that. But but there's an opportunity that the, a lot of companies are not getting certified um, yet. They are they are wanting to prove themselves as being great contractors uh, and, and first, and then they will get certification. So we, we see that as a trend. So as of a list, um, I know our accelerator has a list of companies that we're currently working with to help them scale and grow. That are that are all minority-led and female-led companies, um, but that would be the only other list I could probably offer to you. There, there. I think um, ICIC also had a had a 2022 round of contractors that they were kind of helping to scale nationally, and they too may have a couple contractors in there that are that um, they were working with. They have a, a different model than our accelerator, but they certainly had a few more contractors that may or may not be certified yet. And my last question, Chair, um, the uh, wage disparity, um, and I guess this is the question for um, Chris, on can we start to break down um, income based on or, you know, hourly salary or hours worked um, based on the three categories? Um, I hear a lot, you know, from people in our community that, you know, they're, they, they're that they're not getting the same level of job or getting the same amount of hour, well, not the same, yeah, the same level of job, which is not resulting in the same type of pay. So I, I would love to kind of see if we could break down, um, you know, the wages on the tiers of jobs that are going on in the private and public um, sites. 
Absolutely. So uh, the data set up right now, so there's only certain projects that are required to report the hourly pay to us. And those are the public projects. Uh, like the private projects, they're not required to uh, report the hourly pay for their workers. They're, they're only required to report the hours. So uh, we can uh, produce right now like partial data and, and, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to, um, you know, look at the wage gap, so forth and so on. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's where we are with, you know, in, in terms of, you know, in what you're looking for in that area. Awesome, but we could break down the hours based on pay grade on the private side. It would be on the public side. On the public side, okay. And on the so private side, we can't do it by grade, uh, yeah. Chris? Uh, so the private side, so, so private construction, um, the projects, they're not required to, to report the wages to us. So only the hours. Right, so we could get the hours by, you know, grade or by tail level, whatever they're in the union, right? Right, so we can, uh, you know, do the trades, right? So we can, um, trade, right. you know, average pay of a carpenter or a laborer, you know, based off the prevailing wage scale. So something like that could be done, possibly. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll love to get that information through the chair as well. Yes, okay, great. Noted. All right, I am going to move on to Councillor Breeden and then I have uh, my second round of questions. Councillor Breeden, you now have the floor. Madam Chair, I have no further questions and my, uh, my laptop is about to die. So I want to thank everyone very much for this very important conversation this morning. I'm encouraged. We have so much more work to do, but let's keep at it. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership. And uh, I look forward to continuing this work going forward. Thank you. All right, so I am going to put myself on a timer, um, and I also want to note that we're going to do public testimony um, and then uh, close out. Um, so I guess let me start my timer. So for me, I am going to just um, uplift a few things that we have done on the council to kind of help us kind of grapple with some of these issues. We passed the Fair Chance Act. You know, Jody, we've been really working at making sure that our Boston residents are able to move up the ladder. And I know through that work, we've hired a chief diversity officer. I know that they've gone on maternity leave. I believe they're back. And so we really want to start thinking about how we are using the tools that we already have put in place to help, to ensure that our municipal employees are moving up. Would love to know a little bit about that work um, it, because while this is, you know, we're spending a lot of our time talking about construction. I do know that city and municipal employees are also part of this conversation, and I just want to uplift them in some way. Um, and uh, the other piece of it is that we know that low wages makes it really difficult for you to be able to stay here in the city of Boston. And our office um, worked to secure uh, $750,000 for um, stipends for municipal employees that make under $55,000. Now. I think that as we continue to have these conversations, having worked with the Neighborhoods Jobs Trust folks as well, is that there is an opportunity to really look at what are some of the other gaps that are preventing people from entering the trades and how are we going, how as the city can we help fill in that gap, right? So maybe it's additional stipends for whatever the case is. I think that there's an opportunity there for us to think outside the box. We, um, during the budget process, secured a million dollars for um, for care that works, working alongside the unions to be able to provide childcare, um, early childhood education. It's not childcare, early childhood education, because let's put some respect to that career. For um, for workers to be able to who have shifts that are earlier. So I'm just curious, what if any uh, ha have, has any of that kind of helped, or is is it? In the process, of kind of just, I would love to get an update from you, Jody, on those three very specific things that I just mentioned. And then the other piece is that, look, you know, as um, as diplomatic as we all need to be, because this is what we're trying to do is model behavior in what this political climate is asking us to do. You know, at the end of the day, we can't lose sight of the fact that there's so many Black and Brown people and women who are not getting a fair share of that piece of the pie. And what we are doing when we're not um, creating opportunities for people to have contracts or to have 
access to good union paying jobs, right? We are creating a mass exodus, right? And pushing our Boston residents into different parts of the state. Randolph, Brockton, still in. The majority of the parents that I used to work with when I had my own nonprofit organization have now been displaced to these outer outer um, areas. And so I think there is definitely some consequences here, Jody, that we really need to start grappling with is that, you know, if you're not able to keep a job or get a job here in the city of Boston, then we're moving people out, particularly low income black and brown folks. And so I'm curious as we're looking at this holistically, right? And because we are entering budget season, I need to hear from you, okay, what you need to be set up for success, okay? And then JC, I really would love to hear from you. And you know, how do you define success? Um, because I just don't wanna keep having, this is my, I think eighth, um, we do this every two years. This is my third year, so maybe six, I can't count, whatever. I know I've been here, okay? And I just don't wanna keep coming up and, and asking the same questions. I really wanna to get to a place where we take what we've learned and we actually do something about it. So I'd love to hear what that looks like for you both. And with that, I will defer to you all to answer the questions. Sure, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll answer the, the questions, the very specific questions with regards to the Fair Chance Act and, and hiring into municipal positions. I'm gonna to have to defer that to the Office of Human Resources, who I think has been much more implementing that with one, um, one caveat, which is that the City Academy program is run by our Office of Workforce Development. And this year, with thanks to the council, we have expanded budget to expand City Academy. So we're gonna be including new tracks for school bus drivers and also a new track specifically for wastewater operator and green infrastructure. We're working on that now and we're very excited about the, the two new tracks that are directly building pathways to city jobs by providing the training and pathways to those to those jobs. Um, you know, I think I, I'll defer to Chair Burton on things like stipends for lower, um, to support people. This is something I've heard the chair speak about directly and, and housing support as innovative strategies to, to keep folks in um, the city. But I, I will say that um, project labor agreements were brought up and that they can be a tool, particularly for those public projects and that our office has been working on a toolkit that specifically tries to lay out apprenticeship ratios for public projects that lays out childcare and requirements for, for those child to invest in childcare, even, um, even innovative diversity, equity, and inclusion language. And I think that that's something that we're really trying to build so that we can be a resource for our other agencies within the city of Boston to have that language at the ready. Um, and we'd be happy to share some of the, the language that we've developed over the years. Um, I think those answer the questions with regards to, to budget. Um, I'll defer somewhat to Chief Nguyen, who I know is thinking about this all the time, um, but you know, investing in things like City Academy and those pathways, I think, are have been um, really critical. And I think, uh, not to sound like a, a broken record, but the new Green New Deal workforce needs assessment is really going to define how and where we need to invest dollars to ensure that there are pipelines, training programs, support systems in place so that Boston residents, and especially those who've been most impacted by um, the impacts of climate change, have pathways to the jobs we're creating by the Green New Deal. That's going to be something we'll be seeing over the next year, and I know that we'll be sharing that information because once we define what that is, we'll need the investments to make it happen. Thank you for that. Hey, Chair Burton. Thank you for the question. Uh, there's a, so I have a tendency to try to test things out on my own, and then I bring them back to the to the Boston Employment Commission and see if they work. And, I, and one of the things that I've talked about largely, because I, I can't do this on my own, and I, and I wish that I could, is employer-sponsored housing. Way, way back, there used to be a strategy where a large employer would have a parcel of land, and a parcel of land that around it, it would build houses, and it would help its employees buy those houses or lease those houses and it became a pathway that they would either, they would obviously stay loyal to that company or they would leave. I think there's a new model for employer-sponsored housing in the construction industry specifically that lends itself to um, all those billion-dollar construction companies that I mentioned earlier to really have 
a way to help people either move back into the city to incentivize that, or for them to stay in the city, or for them to buy in the city. Um, I think that that is a something I've mentioned several times that I think it would make sense. I do think that there are stipend opportunities that could help with with the the context of people that have to maybe drive in from out of the city into the city to go to work that that could be helpful if in fact they're trying to buy a house it could be connected with a home first homeowner buyers program that they are trying to buy a home in the city and that may trigger them being eligible for um, you know a, a a a coin on a t or something like that that it gives them a little bit more incentive that they could, could get that money for free that they could save them save um, so tying those systems or strategies together, but I think employee-sponsored housing is a huge opportunity for us, especially as we need housing in the city and it's so unattainable um, at this point in time. I think the Boston Globe did a report back a few months ago saying you needed to make $680,000 in order to purchase a home in the city of Boston. Um, and that's a huge, huge number. The Globe has done some excellent reporting around our industry specifically, but but that one was one that stuck out. Would say, well, even if you're if you're starting off uh, in construction, that seems that appears to be not attainable um, and unattainable in every way. So that would be my current recommendation. I have lots of other ideas that I am working on. I'd be happy to talk to you offline. I think there's some 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 really cool things that can be done to incentivize folks. Yes, Chair, and I am looking forward to working alongside you. I actually filed a hearing order on workforce development housing. So I will be sure that you are on one of the panelists to bring it on uh, when we um, host that hearing. I just think that, you know, as, as I grow in my career in this space, I have been incredibly thoughtful and reflective about kind of like how we meet moments. Um, in, in ways that, you know, really call for us to stretch ourselves, to be a little bit more vulnerable, to be a little bit more honest, to be a little bit more reasonable, right? Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, I, I don't, I didn't see, and because I'm not the, the sponsor of this particular hearing, but, you know, um, the Boston Jobs Coalition folks, I know they've been sounding the alarm and doing a lot of work in this space and so there are some voices here that i i i would love to see as we continue to um grow and and and, and continue these conversations because i think that there's some folks who who are living these realities and i'm glad that some folks have signed up for public testimony that you'll hear from developers and 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 um residents who you know who are hoping for change and so i hope that we'll able we'll be able to deliver that at least that I'll be able to see it um, in my time here in the city of Boston. Um, so with that, I think um, I, I see that Council Burrell has stepped off. I'm going to uh, open it up for public testimony. Um, I think it's important for us uh, that we've had some people who have been incredibly patient, um, and I think we have lost a few folks. Um, um, but I see we have six people um, in the attendees line and I'm going to ask um, Ethan or Ron if you could just confirm for me if who's who signed up. I know we had someone named Mario Mejia that was signed up and I'm, I believe that they got probably thought they weren't, weren't we were never going to call on them but I wanted to just uh, open it up for public testimony and then we'll end. Madam Chair, Ethan has the order. You'll let him in. Okay, great. Ethan, I'll let you help me facilitate. Thank you. I'm just seeing one person in there for now, so I'll, I'll bring him in. Okay, great. Thank you. Councilor Me uh, Chair Mejia, I believe we also had someone uh, as part of a panel. Oh, yeah? Darshay Hood. Uh -oh. he's, he's a DEI manager for Dimeo Construction. Okay. Can you hear me? Wait one second. I'm sorry, then why don't we, I, I don't see him here. Oh, Darche. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now okay. we can. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm so I am. sorry I about that. No, don't be sorry. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, this is really my first um, experience in this, so if I don't know the proper <laughs> procedures, forgive me. Um, I was contacted yesterday and um, told about this call. 
so thank you for calling on me. What I just wanted to say is um, I am manager of DEI at Demio. I've, I've been here for um, about five months now. Um, and what I've realized, I am, um, I'm still a card carrying member of the local six heat and frost insulators um, out of Dorchester. And I was there maybe three months shy of 14 years. Um, and as a black female, I was checkerboarded. So what I've noticed now that I am in um, the role of compliance is uh, the reality is there are a lot of trades, especially um, when it comes to like a site work and demo, where you don't find um, a lot of the women uh, for these requirements, which I've continued to find as a problem. And when we have all of these jobs with the requirements and all of the GCs are pretty much pulling, <laughs> we all have the same numbers pulling from the same areas. Um, it's, I guess it's the support um, from the BRJP as well, uh, being that you have these requirements. So again, I am new to this. So that, that's one of my, that's a question I have, like the support that we have other than just adhering to the requirements. Um, how do we do this as a team? Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, can I, can I ask Darcia just a clarifying question? Yes. Uh, Darcia, you meant thank you for being here. I appreciate that. I know that when my office reached out, can you just explain to folks what checkerboarding is? Because I yeah. used the phrase in there, folks who may not know what that oh. means. Oh, <laughs> construction slang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, checkerboarding. Um, is again these jobs have goals and requirements you know what let me uh here we go these jobs do have goals and requirements and checkerboarding would be uh i would especially as an apprentice when i would be sent to a job that had the I, I am from rhode island our local does cover most of new england as well as rhode island so uh the majority of the beginning of my a career as an apprentice was spent in Boston to um, fulfill those requirements. But what checkerboarding is, this job needs a requirement. We're going to send you here to try to fill up some hours and we're going to bounce you to this other job because at one point I was the only black female in my local. I'm actually the only black female to ever have completed the apprenticeship in local six. So that just speaks volumes to what the GCs are up against. <laughs> um, that's just the reality. So again, that's that was that that's a question like, like being new to this. What support we have um, when trying to achieve these goals? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you know, normally in terms of questions, we usually defer for the colleagues, but I always, no, 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 let me tell you, I switch, you're lucky you're in my hearing because what I believe is that the people, right, who are living the realities and or doing the work usually have far better questions than us as counselors, right? So I am going to um, continue to honor the way that I roll, but normally that, that doesn't happen. So I would love, um, Jody, um, if you don't mind providing some insight and, and, and or JC in terms of just some comments, questions, responses to those questions or, or whatever you feel um, you can offer, I would be more than happy to allow that. Well, actually, uh, I would like to take that question if, if okay. possible, Chair here. We're on a lookout for um, checkerboarding. It's been a common practice throughout the years. And so how we combat that, we, our monitors, a lot of times they have personal relationships with like the women construction workers, right? Because they reach out to us and, and on some cases they know us personally uh, because we're on site. And, and also we, you know, we have a database and we can see when a, when a person's transferred from one project to the next. It's not always to, easy to determine whether a person being checkerboarded or not, because you might be working on one project and then the work is complete. And then you end up, you know, then the person ends up on, a, on another BRJP project that we might have. Uh, and that's because the work is complete. But we can typically tell when a person is being bounced around, right? But just because we not only uh, are we monitoring the project that that person's on, but you know we have other projects that other monitors, and we we know the names of especially women because it's not many women. So but we are on the lookout and we are aware of check and boarding, and we made it we make it perfectly clear in our meetings, absolutely no check and boarding. 
So, and in that we're going to be on the lookout, and we are on the lookout. But, but thank you for that question. No. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate you understanding that I'm learning the process <laughs> as to how this works. Yeah. So I appreciate your even um, allowing me to ask that question. I love it. I love it. Listen, I, I, I think that we need more of this. We need more of this. <laughs> Uh, JC, you want to say anything? Yeah, no, I was hoping we'd have more contractors come to talk because I think their perspective and their engagement um, and their challenges of being open and honest with us around what they're talking about. We try to have that in our monthly meetings, but having them in the hearing would be important. So hopefully maybe the next cycle we can, can come in roles and talk about the challenges and things that they need uh, from us. I, I just want to also add on checkerboarding context. Since checkerboarding is used in a way so that people also don't grow. They don't, they don't, they don't get enough experience allows them to move up the food chain. So they may stay apprentices much longer than they should, or they may stay at a lower weight, lower wage much longer than they should if they were um, given the opportunity to work in a natural trajectory of flow of, of what that career path would be. So that too is another part of it. It is the moving around, but it is the inability for them to learn enough to get to the next station that will allow them to qualify to make more money for whatever those requirements would be for any particular particular union. Um, and so that's, that's I hadn't even heard that we're doing a lot of checkboarding, but that's good to know. The, the second thing about um, incentives or things, that you, the resource that you need, I, I think the, the best resource would be to to participate in the, in the Boston Employment Commission and listen and learn or even read the minutes from that because there are great ideas um, that are being provided that will allow you to be successful in your career as a new DEI manager for Demio Construction, great company. Um, they do really good work, as a lot of others are, but they're just now for developing these job descriptions um, as DEI directors and don't have enough information or like, you know, guardrails of what they should and should not do. You know, perhaps we can host a forum um, for the contractors or trade contractors that are hiring DEI. Um, positions or creating the acquisitions that would allow them to, for those individuals to, to feel like they are supported. Because I'm sure in, in many ways, um, if I put my hat on for when I was much younger in my career, early in my career, I was the de facto DEI coordinator, they didn't call it that 30 years ago, to help find the minority contractors on projects when my company needed it, as well as manage my own projects. It was a, a you know, if I was smart, I should have got paid for two roles, but I didn't I didn't know that, that was what I was doing. So there probably is a, a way to hold a form on this new way, this new job description or this new title that a lot of contractors are, are doing to, to talk more about that. I don't think that's anything we ever talked about, so that perhaps has a budgetary component in it that would um, allow them to even create a sorority slash fraternity that they can all talk to each other. Thank you. Thank you, JC. And, you know, I, I wanted to just uplift that when I used to work at MTV, um, they, I, I felt like now I'm being reminded that I probably experienced some wage theft because um, I was doing multiple jobs and I was not getting paid that same scale as other folks. And there would be times when I was so good at what I did um, that and then I was, I got a little bit more expensive is that they would hire other people for a month or two trying to do what I could do. Um, and they couldn't, and then they would bring me on for two weeks to close the deal and finish off the project because no one else could. And I would just do it. But then I got hip to that. And I said, no, I'm going to pay you, even though I could do it for two in two weeks, I'm going to, you're going to charge, I'm going to charge you what you would have paid me to do it just because I could do it under two weeks. And you're, you're trying to skim me here and there. It's like people of color were always, they're always finding ways to, um, you know, make it harder for us to, to grow and, 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 to, and to just grow. But I, I, I think that there's, I, I've seen that and, and I have experienced it personally and, and, and I see how it, it, it definitely um, is um, unjust. Uh, uh, Counselor Luigi, and you have your hand up. You want to ask um, Ms. Hood a question? Do you want to? Yeah, I wanted to com I wanted yeah. to both comment on yeah. on what um you, you something you said, Darche, and also um, Chair Burton, because we we actually wanted to get and I, I'm appreciative of Darche for showing up. We actually reached out to a number of contractors and subcontractors to get them here. I think there was some hesitancy. There's some like lack of a desire to speak publicly about their interaction and their challenges with BRJP. Um, so, Dasha, that just means make sure, you know, come back again, come back next time, 
because uh, I think there's a lot of learning. And I'd also like to say, I think that forum idea would be great, Chair Burton. And I think it would be great to not only include, um, to not only include our DEI folks at our contractors, because I think that's important, but our unions are like, you know, slowly also uh, doing that. Like IBEW success, they have someone dedicated to DEI. Um, you know, the Carpenters had Charlie Cofield, I'm not sure they have someone yet. And he, I don't even know if he had the, the official DEI title, but there are some unions that are, you know, and maybe they're getting business managers who are of color. Um, I think that we could should find ways to bring them into the fold too. I was also a way of to encourage the locals to, you know, have someone at senior level in the countries that I continue to have with the unions who is thinking intentionally about DEI and how to increase the numbers. So I think it could be good to open up. So just wanted to just wanted to um, put out the, the out there so that Joshua can grow the community of support for you know BRJP compliance, but taking it out of just BRJP compliance. How are we? Um, just getting better at uh, making sure we're bringing folks into these fields who have been historically excluded and marginalized. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Louis-Jean. Um, and I also just wanted to note that we did invite uh, someone for public testimony, but he had to leave. He's also a contractor and a developer, a Latino-owned business who really reached out to our office looking for a way to plug in. And I said, hey, here's this hearing happening. Why don't you come in and be heard here? So. Um, unfortunately, we lost him um, and he was un unable to stay. But I think that as we continue to have these conversations, I think it's, um, and I'm really happy to see the effort that was made to bring in some folks because, again, I want to go back to we can't just have conversations with all of the key stakeholders. We, you know, expanding that tent and making sure that we're bringing people in who are living the realities and or doing the work can provide us some really rich um, insight and perspective. So really glad to have you here, Ms. Hood. Not sure if you want it. I see your hands up, so I'm bringing you back in. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I just wanted to say thank you again. And um, like I said, I wasn't sure how this process works, so I am learning a lot. I think it's important for us to be involved in a conversation and to be forthcoming. Um, so outside of a question, um, because we were speaking of pipelines, I did just want to say that um, uh, Demio does have a program in which, you know, they, um, we, not just an internship program where we take uh, applications from the colleges, but also a program where we do work with like, you know, youth build and the building pathways where we bring in those people who might not have an opportunity, um, not just for the workforce side, but for management. So on the operations, the safety and the engineering side, we just had a young woman come in yesterday actually, but these are the types of um, networks and pipelines I like to see, like coming into the management side, um, not just the workforce side, because it also offers a different lens, different perspective, and an ability to interact and to make change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Ms. Sud, you know, I'm going to be inviting you every year we do a workforce um, development fair with Madison Park and a host of other organizations specifically for uh, young people. Uh, we have a very targeted a group of 18 to 24 year olds that we want to build with. Um, so I want to make sure that we connect with you offline here so that we can plug you into to that planning and just to have you as a thought partner um, in that space. would love to make sure that you are part of our village and I'm glad that we, are, we have you here today. Um, so I am going to again ask um, Ethan if we have uh, anyone else sign, you know, public testimony? I'm not seeing anyone else that signed up, Counselor. All right, thank you, Ethan. Um, so I'm just, I just wanted to thank uh, our panelists um, and our, our, uh, the central staff and our sponsors for bringing this conversation. I think, you know, it is, uh, we have some to-dos and some takeaways from this conversation. Um, uh, JC, we're gonna uh, forward to you. It's called the Chuck Turner Act that we started working on last year. And so we're gonna resuscitate that um, just because we wanna make sure that we bring the work to where it needs to go. And I think working in partnership with you, now that we have new transitions and all that good stuff, Jody um, and Chris, I think that the, we have an opportunity to really kind of like 
take the lead from you all and making sure that we create something that makes sense. So we'll be sending over the draft that we had initially started with um, some folks just so that we can get it to the finish line. And we'd love to do that in partnership with you all. And I know that uh, President Flynn was the one who sparked that uh, recollection for me. So I'll be sure to follow up to his office to make sure that we have some perspective. And I believe, Councilor Louis Jen, we had shared it with your office last year. Not sure if you have had a chance or you want to dive into it or whatever. Can you, so, that? Can you send as well? Cause yeah, I'll send it to you guys again. I know we sent it over to over, but we'll send it again um, just so that we can see where we land and we can move the, that piece of work forward. I think it, it was in a really good place. We had gone back and forth with the commission and um, with Trin and, and Darlene Lamos from um, the Greater Boston Labor Council. So we've had a lot of different players in the, in, so I think it's in a good place. So I'll send it over to you, Councilor Luigi, and for you to review. Um, and, uh, you know, we also had some questions um, that my colleagues asked that, um, Ron, if you could just make sure we get those things on the record and get that information to um, the administration so that we can share it with our colleagues, that would be great. Um, and then just in terms of, of um, next steps, I think, you know, obviously this is a, this is a, it feels like a ceremonial thing that we do. It's part of the, it's part of the uh, uh, ordinance, but I, I do think that we don't have to wait to be told to do an audit and to have a conversation. I feel like we need to get out of the habit of just doing things because just checking off boxes, like literally we have to do this in April and we have to do it in October, but I don't think we should have to wait to have to do something to actually do something. So my hope is, is that we'll continue to be engaged in what this could look like so that we can move the work forward. And Ms. Hood, I see you have your hand up and I'm not sure if you wanted to say one more thing. Okay, good. All right, so um, with that, I am going to um, thank you all again for participating and um, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank, thank you. you.